This is a presentation from the 2013 Cannabis World Summit. Please visit www.cannabisworldsummit.com for more great cannabis information which is available to you completely for free. This information is being made available to you in part thanks to our sponsors. Please visit their websites to learn more about their excellent products and services. The following presentation is for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Leaves of Hope Productions, Inc. Please note that regardless of any statements expressed or implied in the following presentation, that we do not condone you breaking any laws. We are not providing any legal, medical, or financial advice of any kind. No comments about cannabis being a cure for any medical use, expressed or implied, is to be taken as a claim or guarantee. None of the statements have been verified by the FDA of the United States, Health Canada, or the governing organizations of your particular country. And again, this information is being provided for informational purposes only, and the participants exercise their freedom of speech discussing what they believe to be true. We do not guarantee the accuracy of any information provided. It is your responsibility to evaluate the information before you choose to make any use of it. Please consult with a doctor knowledgeable about cannabis prior to using cannabis and or prior to discontinuing any medications you may be currently using. Please check with the laws of your country and region to determine whether you are legally permitted to use and or grow cannabis prior to any involvement with cannabis yourself. Even though we believe that cannabis ought to be legalized, we do not condone you violating any laws. Please review the legal disclaimers on the Cannabis World Summit website and only proceed to enjoy this presentation if you agree with all legal disclaimers, agree to hold the company, Leaves of Hope Productions Inc., and the presenters harmless and are of legal aid in your region. Thanks to Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com for the music used in this introduction. So we have Jamin Shively on the call today, and thank you very much, Jamin, for participating. Uh, he's a pioneer in this budding industry that is opening a lot of doors in this uh, cannabis market. So thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us, uh, Jamin, and, uh, and sharing all of the exciting uh, progress that you're doing with uh, your company, Diego Payser, and, uh, and of course talking about the products that you're, you're working on. But before we get uh, started talking about the company and uh, about the, the, the wonderful products that, uh, that you're producing, uh, we'd like to start off with a little bit about who you are so that people know who it is that we're speaking with and uh, why, why it's important for them to sit up and listen to what you actually have to say. So, of course, you're quite an accomplished businessman. Could you share a little bit about your background for the listeners, please? Yeah, absolutely. And, Bobby, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on, uh, on the uh, Cannabis World Summit. It's very exciting to speak with you and to, to all of your listeners. So good day, everyone. And uh, so a little about myself. Um, I'm 44 years old, and prior to starting Diego Payuser, I was corporate strategy manager at Microsoft, and I was tasked with analyzing and developing new categories of products and services uh, for the company focused mainly on online services such as search, uh, online marketplaces, and specifically business-to-business -business search, business-to-business -business online marketplaces, basically new areas um, where the company could venture into to leapfrog Google and other competitors and essentially create entirely new uh, categories of products and services. So that's a, that's a big part of my background is uh, corporate strategy, and I've applied it in other contexts as well. And uh, it's interesting. And I would imagine how, it definitely uh, correlates with the, the project that you're working on right now. You're definitely creating a new market. You're using those skills with everything that you're working on currently. Yeah, a absolutely. In fact, uh, a big part of my inspiration for, for jumping in was the fact that cannabis over time in the United States alone will become a in the neighborhood of a hundred billion dollar industry. Um, and it's the first time, not just in the history of the United States, but actually in the history of capitalism, capitalism that mm -hmm. such a huge industry materializes virtually overnight. And when I say that, I mean on the time scale of say five to 10 years, in which there does not yet exist a single established brand. 
so coming from my corporate strategy background, it appears it occurs to me as a hundred billion dollar vacuum that's mm -hmm. begging for uh, exciting brands to be established and take root. So it's the most fertile business climate I've ever experienced, and so it's it's really exciting from a business standpoint. And it's interesting. It just so happens that um, well, a little bit more about myself. Uh, having been born in 1968, I, I came of age, so to speak, uh, during the the era of Ronald Reagan. And of course, uh, at that time, Nancy Reagan was going around saying just say no to drugs. And of course, marijuana was uh, very unfairly being lumped together with uh, with other drugs, such as uh, truly dangerous drugs. And um, but in my simple view of the world, I just thought, well, you know, all drugs are bad, and uh, alcohol is okay, you know, drink responsibly. And so the only, uh, the only way that I knew to recreate responsibly was uh, alcohol. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't until many years later, in fact, it was about a year and a half, two years ago, that a very good friend of mine, a colleague at Microsoft, one of the top programmers, uh, told me that he uses cannabis regularly. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. Aren't you worried that it's going to do damage to your brain? And he told me that he had done extensive research and found that cannabis is actually completely harmless. And in fact, he said that he was convinced that within five years, cannabis would come to be regarded. And that mm -hmm. completely blew me away. And, uh, and I tried it, and, I, and so I, I began to, to try it. And small quantities, very occasionally. And it was as if, it was as if, Bobby, as if you had told me that, you know what, Jamin, eating ice cream is actually good for you, and you can eat as much of it as you want, and it's not going to harm you in any way. I mean, I felt like I had been so uh, ripped off by the lies that had been spread about cannabis over the years. And so it was just incredibly delightful and enriching for me to enjoy cannabis in a responsible way and have amazing brainstorming sessions and amazing connections with people and actually transform relationships uh, with friends, with family members. And so I became, uh, you know, going back a year and a half, a year ago, I, I became somewhat of a cannabis evangelist among my friends and, fa and family. And uh, it was just really a, a fascinating journey. And so then when Initiative 502 was about to be passed in the state of Washington, and a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, there's an interesting business opportunity here, and I've got a couple of business partners in Colorado who have been... Hello? Hello, Bob. Uh, yeah, it's Bobby. Jamin? I'm not sure what happened there, but you just uh, dropped off uh, all of a sudden. But, uh... Oh, goodness. Well, well, I'm sorry. What was the last thing you heard me say? Yeah, actually, why don't you just start back from uh, when you had your uh, your your colleagues uh, in Colorado were beginning to mention that there was uh, some sort of a business opportunity there, and we'll just sort of like creatively splice it uh, at that point. Oh, sure, sure. So, and then uh, back, and then when Initiative 502 in the state of Washington was on the ballot and it was about to uh, about to be voted on, uh, a friend of mine called me up. And mentioned that he had some friends in Colorado who were in the business and wanted to expand to the state of Washington. And we started to talk about the numbers and the size of the opportunity. And it uh, quickly became apparent this was a gargantuan uh, business opportunity. And of course, something which by now I was very, very passionate about from just the, the social use and creative uh, sides of cannabis in terms of, of the creative, the boost in creativity that one can get um, enjoying a fine sativa. And so um, we got together and started to look at it very seriously. And given my, my family history, my, uh, the fact that my great-grandfather, Diego Peyser, was the largest grower of hemp in the world in the late 1800s, um, and given that he is, uh, is just such a distinguished looking gentleman. He was, he was killed towards the end of the Spanish-American War. He supplied the, uh, the Spanish Armada, the Spanish fleet, with hemp rope during the Spanish-American War. And so given, given all of that, I started uh, my 
my fiance and I got together and started playing around with uh, with his picture and created the kind of the first version of a logo. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I showed this to to my friend who had called me, and uh, we started looking at the numbers and the opportunities, and it quickly became apparent that there was a huge opportunity here to create a brand which would come to represent premium cannabis at the retail level. Mm-hmm. And so that's how uh, that's how we we kind of got into it initially. And uh, given that it's it's such a huge budding market and there's so much interest in it, and, and given that there was as of yet no established brand, particularly at the retail level, um, a nationalist nationally established brand, uh, and none that certainly none that represents uh, exclusively premium cannabis, um, it was like a just a huge low hanging fruit just there for the taking from a business standpoint. And so what we did was we uh, immediately began to make plans to do press releases. And I was pleasantly surprised to find just how uh, interested the the media was in covering this story. And so as soon as I just started putting out a few press releases uh, to the to the local, local media, um, boom, there was just an immediate amount of interest and in, that blossomed to national media interest. And we did this in advance of uh, the first phase of legalization in the state of Washington coming into effect, which was midnight on December 5th. And um, so what we did was we created a we created an event which distinguished ourselves um, kind of diametrically opposite to the event that was happening at the Space Needle at exactly the same time. So while there were while there were news crews out at the Space Needle, there was a bunch of media uh, over at, at our place uh, filming uh, the uh, midnight, uh, the the exact moment when it became legal to possess and consume cannabis in the state of Washington. And we had our by then we um, had. That must have been a fantastic moment, just for what it's worth. Like, uh, of course, I was even celebrating it over here, even though it didn't apply to me legally, but uh, and other people as well. I was speaking as well. We were all celebrating in our hearts for you guys because that was a, a historic moment. Oh of, of yeah, great significance. Oh, and it's a, it's a celebration for all of humanity and for the mm-hmm. plant itself. Uh, it's a celebration for all living creatures that that uh, this magical plant is finally beginning to be set free and people who, who love and enjoy it are, are, are beginning to be set free. So, I love yeah, the way was, you just put was, that, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, it, was, it was a magical historic moment. And what we wanted to do was basically appeal to um, a much, much broader audience, including an audience of people who had never consumed cannabis before and who, like I had grown up, uh, with uh, had preconceived notions that it was somehow bad or dangerous or harmful, and so uh, we didn't want to isolate uh, th- those audiences. In fact, the opposite. We wanted to embrace them, and we wanted them to be able to look at us in a in a favorable light, and at least have an openness to to listen to what we had to say about it. And so, at the precise moment of midnight, rather than breaking out the bongs or the vaporizers, we actually popped the champagne bottle and toasted to the beginning of of the end of prohibition of cannabis. Wow. And the beginning of legalization. Yeah, so we, we toasted and um, and said some words uh, and had some and then did some more interviews with, with various other media and in the days and weeks that followed got a lot of invitations for national uh, television coverage from all the major networks, ABC, CBS, CNN, CNBC, Fox News. And um, so it was uh, just a really exciting time and an well, historic opportunity. Yeah, go ahead. Just for what it's worth, it, it just sounds like such a classy way to welcome in a new era. Like uh, rather than, of course, it would have been appropriate to still break out the bongs or, or whatever, but to do it in the customary way of breaking out a bottle of champagne. It, it, I think it really nicely goes along with your theme of 
of having premium cannabis, uh, like the, the, setting up the stage for your company. It's a classy company, and the way that you've actually welcomed in this this new legal era uh, with this classy uh, party that you've uh, just verbally portrayed. I, I actually, I'm very impressed with with everything that you're saying right now uh, about uh, how you're perceiving this plant, how you've welcomed this uh, that uh, that momentous uh, his, historical moment. And and everything that you're saying, actually, it's uh, I, I I of course recognize that as a businessman, you see the business opportunities here, but you're not just going at it from a, a business perspective exclusively. You do recognize that from the words that you're saying, uh, I definitely sense that you definitely recognize that it truly has been uh, demonized unnecessarily, and you do recognize the, the what this plant truly represents and what it really is, and I, I'm just impressed with everything that you're saying so far and I, I hope that the listeners are getting that impression as well just from what they've heard from what you've just said a moment ago as well thank you Bobby and in fact it's interesting um, at this particular moment in history it is actually virtually impossible to be an entrepreneur or a business person in the cannabis industry without also being an advocate and without being absolutely passionate about this amazing plant and what it can do for for humanity in so many different ways, not just in the in the medicinal or recreational or creative uh, or social aspects, but also in terms of hemp as an industrial product, which is of course how my great grandfather uh, used hemp on a very large scale. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, it's it's um, it, it's something that if I did not have the passion that I have uh, for this for this plant. It would be impossible for me to do what I'm doing, and given how much misinformation exists and how divided uh, the United States is on the topic in terms of the people, of the, the people of the United States, it's I don't, I don't really know if divided is the right word because the people who oppose it oppose it mainly out of ignorance. It's not that they have you know some yes. real you know firm belief that you know well, based but- on the facts. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's far less harmful than alcohol, and alcohol is is widely accepted by society, except for you know certain individuals, and um and so it's it becomes a matter for me. It's a matter of simple logic. If you think it's okay for alcohol to be, you know, regulated and sold and and enjoyed legally uh, by adults, then you should be twenty times as as favorable to cannabis. Given that, is far, given that it is far safer. And so it's really, you know, it's not so much of a divide like you would find a divide along religious lines where there's simply no hope to, or, or not, I wouldn't say no hope, but it, where it's a much more difficult conversation to get someone to change their mind about a particular religion or point of, or philosophical point of view. Here it's simply a matter of exposing the facts. And the yeah, they've facts just been are, brainwashed with the propaganda for all these uh, decades. And so... Uh, they're holding on to false uh, false beliefs, and that's the basis of uh, of their being opposed to it. But what I found is that, of course, I'm sure you you see the exact same thing. People who are you know extremely opposed to cannabis, once they are aware of truth, once they are aware of the facts, they completely change their minds and they become a lot more open to it. And in fact, many of them become activists or or to varying different degrees of uh, activism, they definitely are pro-cannabis once they know what the truth of, uh, of the matter is, what the facts are around that. But, um, yeah. but before we... Go ahead. Yes? Go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, I was just going to actually uh, ask about your grand, uh, Greek grandfather, Diego Pelissier, uh, Pelissier, sorry uh, for the pronunciation there. Um, can you talk a little bit about your grandfather? Of course, uh, you have cannabis in your blood. Uh, can, you, uh, can you share with us who was this man? Of course, uh, so, uh, he's got a great history uh, in, in, in the United States as well. Uh, he, he was a great uh, farmer. Perhaps he can uh, explain to us uh, who he was, what, uh, what his significance was, and so that people realize that you really are, uh, have your roots deeply uh, in, the, in the soil with, uh, with cannabis. So this is not just something that you're recognizing as a, as a business opportunity. Uh, it's, it's in your genes, so to speak. So can you uh, just tell us who Diego was? Yeah, absolutely. So my great-grandfather, Diego Pacer, was born in 1865 in the small town of, of Era Alta in uh, the region of Murcia in Spain. And he uh, was a very smart 
uh, young man, and he went to study civil engineering at the University of Madrid. And after completing his university studies, he his choices were basically either go and participate in one of the wars of conquest uh, that Spain was engaged in in Africa at the time, or to uh, take a, a political uh, position in the Philippines. And so he cho obviously chose the latter and became the vice governor of the Philippines. And over time, he accumulated a vast uh, land holding in the island of Cebu, uh, over 7,000 acres on which he grew hemp. And um, he was a very innovative person, and he came up, he invented a, a machine for processing hemp, which he patented. And uh, so things were going really well. And then, um, then the Spanish-American War started to kind of heat up, and so he sent his, uh, his wife and their uh, three daughters, his wife actually had a, they actually had a fourth daughter on the way, um, sent them all to, uh, back to Spain to, you know, to be, so for safety purposes during the war. And then um, as the war was, was, look, was looking like it was going to be winding down, he sent for them to come back to the Philippines. And so they came back, but but tragically, he was killed towards the end of the war. Uh, since he had so much land, there were some greedy folks on the American side who wanted that property. And um, so he was killed. And so my, my, his wife and my grandmother and my grandmother's sisters were now, uh, you know, widowed and orphaned in the Philippines and uh, had went through some, diff some difficult times growing up. My grandmother was raised in a convent. And in, in fact, she was the, uh, I think she, she was the only uh, uh, child of Spanish extraction in this convent that was otherwise uh, native Filipinos. And so she had quite an experience growing up and went, uh, then later went to the University of Manila and was working in Manila. One of her jobs was as a tutor uh, teaching, teaching uh, Spanish to uh, to, to foreigners, and very notably were the Americans who were there setting up setting up businesses and uh, helping out in the government and things of that sort. And so my grandfather, uh, uh, Richard Shively from Ohio, was uh, was in the Philippines representing Goodyear Tire and Rubber, and he uh, he met my grandmother. And she started tutoring him, and so he started learning uh, Spanish from her. And of, and of course, they hit it off and got married in the Philippines, and then uh, moved back to back to the United States, back to Ohio. And they had seven children, and the fourth of which is my father, John Shively. And so I've I've always been told by my father and my grandmother, Josefina Peyser, who who also lived with us for many years while I was growing up. Um, I, I heard directly from her the, the stories about growing up in the Philippines and growing hemp and the cook in their house who was from a headhunter clan in the Philippines and all these really amazing stories. And, um, and in fact, I was actually, my dad wanted me to be named after my great-grandfather Diego. The English for Diego is James, but my mom didn't like the S at the end of James, and so they played around with it and came up with Jamin. So I've always, you know, had I've always had this picture of my great grandfather physically, a black and white picture of him hanging on the wall. Is that the one that's on your uh, logo on your website. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And and hearing all these stories and the fact that I was named after him uh, in, a, in a way um, was uh, so it's always just been a part a part of me. And so every all the stars sort of aligned in the sense that um, I have this tremendous passion for the plant. I'm, uh, I'm a passionate advocate in the face of all the injustice that's been done to the plant over the years. And also, I, I've always been um, a bit of a uh, sort of a creative, a creative rebel in the sense that when I see something that's, that's not right, I like to step in and do something about it, even if it's unpopular um, among a lot of people. And even if I get a lot of flack for it, I was I was a, I was definitely an entrepreneur within Microsoft, 
an, an entrepreneur is, is, is sort of a, a seldom used term. It means an entrepreneur operating inside of a larger corporation. And Microsoft um, has suffered from a, a, a lack of innovation in the past decade. And um, it's really been a tragedy for the company that once had the world by the tail. And so I was, I was working very hard to come up with new business models and new categories of products and services for Microsoft to develop and, uh, and lead in. Um, but, in, but Microsoft, for the most part, has ignored such attempts uh, at true innovation and has simply uh, worked hard to shore up its existing businesses and in some cases losing uh, lots and lots of money, like in the case of search. Uh, the Bing search engine is basically just chasing Google's taillights, um, in a, so to speak, in the sense that it's not doing anything fundamentally different uh, from what Google does. And so I proposed a number of business models and actually developed them and prototyped a couple of them uh, to do something completely different, which would leapfrog Google into new areas. And so having had this experience of going against the current and standing up for what I believe is right, um, mm -hmm. it was this opportunity, the cannabis opportunity, became just the perfect opportunity for me and for my life. And what's so it's almost really like you're being groomed into this opportunity in a sense with, uh, with all your past experiences. D definitely, definitely, I including experiences uh, in the media. We, before joining Microsoft, I did a startup um, in, in Mexico where I, we were where my company, Shively International, was building and operating educational computer centers inside public schools and also cyber cafes. And this was at a time when the digital divide in Mexico was particularly particularly severe, where you have um, lower class and lower middle class um, children who simply cannot have access to computers because they're imported, therefore they're very expensive. And the cost of bandwidth is very high in Mexico, or certainly was at that time. Now it's gotten a lot better. But anyway, did uh, did a big, big project there um, with the state government of Sinaloa. Uh, President, Mexican President Vicente Fox came to inaugurate our 25th computer center. It was his, actually his first official visit as president to that state um, as president of Mexico. And so I also had have had a fair amount of experience uh, in the media, in you know, national Mexican media, U.S. media, local media, including including um, people making claims that I was somehow exploiting, uh, you know, schools and children and whatnot. Actually, nothing could have been further from the truth. Our our educational computer center project, which gave over twenty five thousand students their first access to computers. Um, that was actually a big loser for our company because uh, because of uh, the corruption in the schools and, and in the, the local government, um, it became virtually impossible to make money unless we had participated in that corruption, which we, of course, would, would not do. And so we became a victim of that corruption. But anyway, so in, in the end, I, 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 one, of the, one of the great things that I got out of that experience was a was having been a target of the media and of, of unfair criticism. And so I, I learned from that experience that I could actually withstand a fair amount of unfair criticism and uh, defend myself and the position that I was standing in and what my company stood for. And in the end, in the end was able to uh, persevere and, and build a successful business in Mexico in spite of all the lies and stories that were being told. Um, and so, may I, may asking, I just interject? May I just uh, interject here a little uh, question for you? I was going to ask you this uh, much uh, later on in the conversation, but uh, of course, there seems to be a, a bit of a, a stigma in uh, in the minds of people. There's there's a lot of uh, a lot of opinions right now. Of course, uh, there are some people who want 
big business to to become involved uh, in the cannabis uh, legalization process and uh, in this industry and there's a lot of people who would prefer to just uh, have it uh, uh, be untouched left alone just so that people can grow it in their backyard so to speak like that so there's a lot of differing opinions uh, about that and so of course just based on what you've just said that uh, in a sense you've been demonized uh, unfairly by by the media uh, there there seems to be a little bit of uh, that sort of thing happening in the cannabis industry as well where there's a lot of people who are uh, perhaps just to put it mildly they're leery of big business uh, becoming involved with cannabis do you have anything to say that uh, that can perhaps alleviate some of uh, some potential concerns that some people might be having but also like we've uh, previously discussed uh, before the call as well um, seeing how this process with the uh, the big companies is actually a beneficial thing for the legalization uh, movement. So can you just touch on, on that, just since you've already were discussing that with uh, the project that you've had uh, earlier with the computers in Mexico? Oh, sure, sure. Well, first of all, one clarification. So I am not a big business person. I have worked for big companies, but okay. what I am is what I am is an entrepreneur who has gotten together with friends and previous colleagues who are also very passionate about cannabis. And uh, we are we're building a company from the ground up. So we're not affiliated with any large corporation. We have no intention of becoming affiliated with, with large corporations. We've heard the rumors that, that yeah, maybe you know, big tobacco or big alcohol is going to get into this. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I don't have any... Uh, actual facts uh, of that matter. So okay. our business is actually, we think of our business, we, we would like to grow to become uh, you know, a medium-sized company or even a large company over time. Um, but we actually see our business as sort of, a, sort of like a hybrid um, between uh, big business and small business in the sense that we want to buy uh, our cannabis products from small artisan growers of cannabis, uh, much like the ones who have been growing cannabis uh, successfully at a small scale and with a tremendous amount of passion uh, for the particular strains that they have developed. And I visited with a number of these growers in the state of Washington and the state of Colorado. And it's always just such an inspiration to meet with these people. Um, who are having just the time of their lives working very hard and producing amazing products uh, that, they're, that, they, that they believe in and are extremely passionate about. So in, in a sense, what, what we would like to grow to become, rather than like a big Philip Morris or an Anheuser-Busch that has massive processing plants that are doing things very much as a you know, big manufacturing operation, we want to be more like almost like the whole foods of cannabis, where we're buying from, from hundreds, eventually thousands, of small artisan producers and presenting to the customer uh, quite a variety of, uh, of, super, of super premium uh, products. So that, that's, that's, that's where we stand. Now, as far as the question of what do I think about uh, large businesses getting into the industry, um, I, I sort of, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about it. I would, I would like, personally, I would love to see the cannabis industry uh, remain sort of like a small artisan industry, um, much like the craft brew industry and craft beer industry or, or, or even the wine industry where you just have thousands of producers of, mm -hmm. of artisan wines. And, and, and also, and, of course, I mean, with the wine, uh, you can also make your own wine at home, although most people don't go to the, to the trouble. They actually prefer to buy a bottle that's uh, well done and from a store. Uh, but, yeah. but to still have that freedom is essentially what I'm saying here. Oh, oh yeah. No, I think, that, I think that people should absolutely have the freedom to grow their own cannabis at home. And, uh, you know, as long as, they're, as long as they're adhering to the law and not either giving it or selling it, to, to young people under the age of 21, I think absolutely, just as, and just as people brew their own wine and beer at home and are also subject to the exact same laws where they cannot either give it or sell it to people under the age of 21, or in the case of beer and wine, maybe they can't sell it, period, I don't know. I'm sure they, yeah, they would probably have to have a license in order to, to brew it and then sell it to someone. Um, but I mean, so there are wonderful parallels 
with alcohol, which, uh, which we can learn from and build off of for the cannabis industry. And as far as, as far as big businesses like Anheuser-Busch or, you know, Ernest and Julio Gallo in, in the case of wine, um, big businesses and small businesses coexist quite well in the alcohol industry. And um, I don't see any reason why they could not coexist uh, in the cannabis industry. Because one, one thing to keep in mind is while cannabis is, is a pretty expensive product, right now given, well, for a lot of reasons. But while it is expensive, it also makes it difficult for people who truly need it uh, to obtain it at a reasonable cost. And so one of the, the, there could be a potential benefit of larger businesses getting into the business, which is that the cost of, of you know, let's just call it mass-produced uh, cannabis, that would definitely go down. While at the same time, um, as, as you and most cannabis users know, uh, the difference between a truly amazing uh, uh, cannabis bud, not just an amazing variety, but where the cultivation techniques um, are, are done by someone who just has a tremendous amount of love and dedication to the plant, there's no comparison. There's no I could take two clones and uh, give it in the hands of two different people, and you'll have two different outcomes. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I, I, I have mixed feelings about uh, the the opportunities and challenges presented by big business interests getting into the business, um, but I, I think in the end uh, that quality will come to uh, be the determining factor, which determines which companies succeed and which don't. And uh, I certainly hope that the laws will evolve to permit people uh, to grow their own product in their own home and uh, and enjoy it responsibly in that manner. Now, just out of curiosity, uh, uh, regarding big business becoming involved, um, of course, the governments are swayed by the financial interests of, uh, of corporations. And, uh, of course, if big businesses do decide to uh, get into this industry, uh, how do you feel, uh, do, do you think that that would, perhaps it be a beneficial thing for all of us in the sense that uh, if they choose to go into this industry, that they'll push the laws to, to become a lot more open so that we're no longer battling this prohibition, so to speak. So is it possible that uh, the, uh, the big industry could actually have a beneficial role in that respect? Oh, it is absolutely possible. In fact, that is, in my view, the, the single most important positive outcome that could result from big businesses getting into the business. They would have a lot of influence over government. Not all of it would be positive. Of course, the big positive influence would be that they would uh, help push the trend of legalization forward. Some, certainly, our company uh, is, is doing our part to do that. Of course, larger businesses would do that. Um, in a, in can, you even, share, can you share any of the, what your, your company has already done to sort of push those agendas forward a little bit? Well, we, we've hired a lobbyist uh, in the state of Washington, uh, and we've been building relationships at the state government level and also at the local government level uh, just to engage in conversation and, and simply express this is what we're doing, and we're completely open to any feedback that the government may have. So if, there's, if there are specific concerns that government, governments or even you know, community groups have, we want to hear those. And um, our doors are always open, our ears are open uh, to hearing any feedback that folks have. And so we really believe in engaging in constructive dialogue with government at all levels, community groups, citizens groups at all levels, um, our neighbors, our friends. And so it's, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity. Just, you know, just uh, being out there in a public way has, has created opp tremendous opportunities to have these conversations, such as the conversation that, that you and I are having, Bobby, which now, thanks to the, the Cannabis World Summit, um, we're able to share with a much broader audience. So I want to thank you for, for what you're doing. Um, you're welcome. So, thank you, too. You're welcome. Yeah. So a little bit about your company, actually. Uh, we haven't uh, really talked too much about that yet. Um, 
where where's your company going? Of course, uh, I understand that you're you're planning on opening up a bunch of retail locations in both uh, Washington and uh, and Colorado. I think you have a dozen for each uh, state uh, slated in the future. Uh, can you just share with us a little bit of the plans? Of course, I understand that uh, it's a lot contingent upon the the, the legal environment uh, as well. So some of those plans may uh, may change depending on what happens over the coming months. But can you just uh, give us a little bit of a foresight into what you're working towards, what we can expect, and what we're what we're hoping ultimately will happen soon. Right, right. So what we're hoping for is that we will be granted licenses to to open stores um, in Washington and Colorado, about a dozen each, depending on the size of the of the stores that we're permitted to to open. It could be larger numbers if we're only uh, permitted to open smaller stores. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's it's a really interesting and complex process because uh, in in under more normal circumstances, we might just be uh, leasing all the properties that we would need, but we're actually considering buying uh, buying buildings so that we can uh, so that we don't have the issue of uh, a landlord, a, a property owner, who is concerned about getting their property con confiscated. Um, but actually, it, it's really interesting. You see, we we actually do not want to be in a situation where we're breaking any laws, state or federal laws. And so um, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what our position is, which is that we will not uh, either inventory or sell cannabis until it becomes, and here are the two key words, sufficiently legal. Until and it what becomes, does that mean? You know that's a really that's that's a million dollar question. What does it mean? I don't know. I wish I knew exactly what it meant. <laughs> I mean, okay, Between the state know, and I, federal laws. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's the thing. So uh, according to state laws, it's clear that it will become sufficiently legal according to Washington state law and Colorado state law to open mm -hmm. retailers for for social use cannabis. Um, but under federal law, it's still a Schedule One controlled substance, and being on the market in such a big way as we as we would like to be, um, that opens us up as a target uh, potentially to um, the federal government for saying, you know what, let's make an example of these folks. You know, they've opened up a dozen stores, they're doing a huge amount of business, and you know, let's uh, let's shut them down. You know, I, we're going to have a much bigger impact. You know, kicking in the doors of a dozen Diego Payuser. Uh, retail outlets um, than we would by going after the the smaller folks. So uh, let's do this. You know, so that's not a situation that we want to be in. Mm -hmm. And so what we're hoping is that through the the ongoing efforts of the, the state government of the state of Washington and the state of Colorado, which are having uh, dialogue with the federal government, we're hoping that positive things will emerge from those conversations such that we will actually be able to operate in a completely legal way or, again, a sufficiently legal way. I mean, one positive step would be to move cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. I mean, it really should be characterized um, uh, for, for federal government purposes. It should be characterized as a, as a medicine or a medicinal herb, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, also, which also has positive social and creative uses. And so, um, you know, it's a really, it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, balance between being the company that we want to be, being the advocates that we are, and also obeying the laws so that we can be law-abiding citizens, set a good example, and not expose ourselves as a big target for the federal government. Well, definitely don't want to go down those, uh, those roads where go to jail or have your company shut down uh, unnecessarily that would just uh, put a lot of complication and of course uh, it would just put a few steps uh, backwards for for your company personally but also uh, on a federal and, and legal level I don't want to give them the opportunity to do that um, so I respect what you're saying I've actually taken uh, personal steps along the same lines with uh, with the cannabis summit I've uh, actually uh, I mentioned to you earlier I've actually quit cannabis myself 
uh, in order to to ensure that the Cannabis Summit, uh, Cannabis World Summit, actually uh, proceeds without any interruptions, because uh, the last thing I need is uh, to to be arrested, and that of course would have a negative impact upon the summit. If you understand what I'm saying. So, so I, I think it's important for uh, for everybody uh, to be taking those uh I think that also is an important message for any entrepreneurs who are getting into this industry to be mindful of evolving and developing businesses with the eventual legalization in mind, but without crossing those lines to get themselves into any potential hazardous situations, uh, legally or, or otherwise. So I think it's... Yeah, and it, it, in fact, Bobby, I'd like to comment on that. So our company, we've actually, what we're doing is, is really special in our view because since we're not in the business currently, on the medical side, either as a grower or as a medical uh, medical cannabis dispensary, um, we have an op. Since we're not in the business at all, we're not possessing it, we're not retailing it, we're not growing it. We are in a privileged position where we can speak out very publicly, very openly, um, and have a lot of impact as advocates and as a company that is expressing an, an intention to get into the business, subject to the condition of sufficient legality being met. And mm -hmm. so it, it's it's really a special and unique opportunity for us, and we feel a, a, a particular responsibility to the whole industry, given that we have this this uh, this special position uh, to speak out loud and clear, and to um, be to represent uh, responsibility and to represent uh, caution and safety and address the the concerns of many, many people in the United States and around the world that, look, we've got a golden opportunity to uh, promote uh, widespread legalization across multiple countries because this, the, this thing is a, is a very clear trend. And to keep the trend moving along in a positive direction, we need to do it in a very responsible and cautious way. And so what we have is a golden opportunity to do exactly that through the advocacy that we're doing and through uh, the, the, all the, 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 media, the media interviews that we're doing, the outreach, um, and we're going to be doing a lot more of these, of these things over time. And uh, so it's... Well, uh, just for what it's worth, I think the people listening to this uh, should really recognize what you're saying between the lines, uh, like what, what's really... Be, uh, being said here that's not necessarily totally uh, expressed is that even though you have a business opportunity that you recognize and you're, you're working towards, you're actually doing something at this time, of course, paving the way for the business opportunity, but what you're actually doing is a tremendous service to, to the American public, to actually uh, for everybody around the world and even the planet in the sense that you're raising awareness and you're raising a lot of a lot of conversation is happening around all the activities of what you're doing, and as a result, people are losing those uh, those false beliefs. They're beginning to realize what the the, the truth and the facts uh, of the matter uh, really are, and you're actually helping to move the the, the mindset of the people and the and the population and, and the, even the government towards a positive direction. You're actually a very influential force. Uh, in in this overall process, uh, and I, I think that uh, we need to recognize that what you're doing is uh, is very beneficial for all of us. And in that respect, I actually wish you tremendous success. Once eventually everything becomes legalized sufficiently that you may actually possess the product and sell it, uh, I I you out, I wish for you outstanding success because of all that you're doing. And I see that your heart's in the right place here. That you're also uh, doing this for from a very positive perspective of, of, of helping this cause overall to be moving forward. So just I think people should be aware of what, what you've just said actually has those implications and, and hopefully that uh, once you're selling these products that uh, they'll actually come by to your stores and actually purchase some of your products to, to enjoy it for what it is but also as a way of saying thank you for what you're actually doing. Oh, Bobby, I really appreciate all that you've just said. I, I appreciate your recognizing 
uh, the contributions that we're having and uh, and acknowledging it. That's that's very that's very kind of you. And in fact, um, what's what's really interesting is that um, we're at first um, when I was looking at this opportunity from a business standpoint, a business I could be passionate about. Here's what I saw. This is a really important point that that cuts to the heart of advocacy and 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 everything that you just said, Bobby. Uh, very well said. Here, and the point is this. At first, we were looking at this as, hey, this big wave of opportunity is coming. Let's get on our surfboards and ride this wave and have the time of our lives doing it. Great. Mm -hmm. And then we jumped out and, and, and did press releases and got, on the media, got in, in front of the media and everything else. And, and the result was something much bigger than, than we had anticipated. And we actually discovered that rather than just riding this wave, we became part of the wave. <laughs> and that, yeah, and that was, that was a profound transformation. And I wake up every day thinking about it and like, wow, is this really happening? I mean, you know, it's like little old me just, you know, wanting to, to run a great business, which I love, and now here I am uh, being an advocate and being part of this incredible movement, which, Bobby, you are also a huge part of, and and so many thousands upon thousands of other people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I met with uh, Rick, Rick Cusick of uh, High Times Magazine in the, on my last trip to New York. We had a great interview. Um, and while we were, while we were, uh, while we were interviewed, well, it wasn't so much an interview, it was just a conversation. We just got together and had a great conversation. And while we were doing that, uh, my, uh, my friend Craig Dentrone from uh, Punched in the Head Productions was uh, filming us as, you know, as, as, as the beginning stages of creating uh, what will become an ongoing television series about our company and about the advocacy that we're doing. So it's something that we you know we just got out there and started and just started with the the seed of an idea and started getting out there and taking action and suddenly and then over time it's just blossomed into this incredible uh team which is something else i i really want to acknowledge we have built an amazing team and um I'm 44. Most of the most of the folks on on our team, Diego Payasera, there's about 15 of us uh, now. Uh, most of us are are in their 50s, and it's amazing. So uh, as we would as we were building our company and and uh, and doing media outreach and whatnot, people would hear about what we're doing, and through our our growing network, um, we'd be introduced to. I mean, we we were introduced to. Um, one of the uh, one of the top architects in the country, who's uh, who's here in Seattle, who has built homes for most of the billionaires in the state of Washington, creates just these amazing palaces as an architect. And um, when when I was introduced to him, I thought, you know, gee, what are the chances that this incredibly accomplished architect is going to be interested in in designing our stores? And he just was absolutely carried, absolutely captivated by what we're doing and thought it was just absolutely brilliant and would and said yes would love to be a part of this and likewise a, a, a colleague a former colleague from Microsoft incredibly accomplished uh, a person is uh, now working with us um, in a in a very big way helping develop our our business plan and financial projections and a lot of aspects of, of, of the planning stages of what we're doing. And likewise on the operations side, on the marketing side, on the legal side, we've got one of the most uh, uh, who are just in love with the idea and in love with what we're doing. And it, it, it's, it's again becoming when you become part of the wave, uh, so many other great people get swept up in it and want to be a part of it. In, in fact, since, uh, since we've got a, a pretty big audience out there listening, um, I want to mention that we've gotten, I've personally gotten so many inquiries, uh, people who want to have conversations, and I just don't have a, a, enough hours in the day uh, to respond to everyone. In fact, I, I actually need some help. Uh, to well, Jamin, 
on that note, I'm I'm very grateful and humbled that you actually accepted my my invitation to uh, to have this conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, ab- absolutely, Bobby. I, I I love the fact that. Hey, wh- where are you in Canada? I'm actually in Ottawa, Ontario, right oh, okay. in our nation's capital. Everything is uh, <laughs> happening legally, uh, so to speak, but uh, I'm not directly involved with that. Uh, just a coincidence that I happen to be here, but who knows? Perhaps uh, the way I look at it, uh, like your life has been groomed in a sense to put. Yes, I recognize that from your story, and of course, who knows? Perhaps I'm in Ottawa because uh, perhaps I might play a role at some point uh, down the road. Uh, although, I uh, just want to say, for what it's worth, uh, listening to what you were saying, how you, in a sense, were humbled by being a part of that wave that you were speaking about a few minutes ago. Um, yeah. I, I seriously, if someone told me uh, a couple of years ago that I'd be where I am right now, being a part of that wave as well, and of course, there's hmm. thousands of other people who are a part of this wave, but. Uh, you're you're definitely a part of the wave. So am I, actually. And uh, I would not have believed such a prophecy a couple of years ago. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it just yeah. it just sounds outrageous in in a sense. But uh, but uh, you know what? It's also quite an adventure, I think. And uh, life life is meant to be an adventure as well, to be enjoyed, savored, like a a fine cognac or a cigar <laughs> or a Diego yeah. Pace product. <laughs> Right, right, exactly, and and uh, you know what's interesting is it, it, it is a tremendous adventure. Just like you said, I mean, two years ago, two years ago, I wasn't even consuming cannabis, and the mm-hmm. thought that I would actually be selling it like a drug dealer—it's like it's absolutely <laughs> incredible. I I would not have believed it for an instant. I would have said that's completely ridiculous. No, I would never do that. <laughs> and it wasn't until I learned about the truth of it. And and what was happening in this in this whole movement? And uh, Rick Steve is a good friend of mine who does the the travel shows. He's mm-hmm. a huge advocate for for marijuana legalization, and he's been a huge inspiration to me, as have many many other people. And so, um, but it, it has also required a, a huge amount of courage. In fact, um, way back in November, uh, we you know before we even did our our press releases, but we were planning for it. I actually. Mm-hmm had a moment where I said, you know what, I'm not ready to do this. I'm not ready to step out in front of the cameras and essentially have the cannabis leaf branded on my forehead forever. Because, I mean, you Google my name now and, you know, whatever accomplishments I had, yeah, it, it, whatever accomplishments I had in the past are now completely lost in a sea of cannabis-related media. So, Jamin Shively, cannabis, Right. For, forever, and so you know, if I ever wanted to get a job at a big company or something like that, all <laughs> one quick Google search would reveal, hey, this guy is you know the Bill Gates of Bud or you know various things that they've called me, mm-hmm. and so um, it's it's it was really like jumping off a cliff in a way, and it, were it not for the moral support of some good friends and family that you know, hey, this is a huge historic opportunity. Let's seize this moment and let's do it. I mean, but it was it was really really scary at first, and then of course once I started, it just the, the positive uh, benefits um, far outweighed uh, any you know risks or negative associations, and uh, so I've just been in the wave and riding the wave and a part of it ever since, and it certainly has not been without challenges. I, I can I can tell you that. Um, but, well, uh, if I may just interject here, uh, one thing I. I... <laughs> It's just astounding to me how many parallels I hear in your story that uh, that is a reflection of my own, actually. And, hmm. uh, of course, I've had a lot of challenges as a result of this. In fact, uh, the past few months have been extremely challenging for me on a personal level, uh, family-related issues and, and, and other things as well. I won't get into that right now. But one thing I do want to say is that I've always respected activists and people who stood up for what they believe in. I've always respected them. However, I think that you can probably relate to what I'm about to say, is that now you have a higher and much deeper, profound respect for activists who stand up for what they believe in because you recognize from your own personal experience the challenges and the cojones you have to have in order to do what you're doing because, it, in a sense, it's scary. You're going against uh, the, the grain of society, although, of course, you do see uh, the, that, that society will be going into a favorable direction, but you are ahead of the, the pack, and 
nonetheless, it is scary territory to be in. And so from that perspective, with all the, the challenges that you've gone through, that I've gone through, um, would, you, would you say that anybody who's been before us, a, a cannabis activist, that you have much deeper respect for them? I mean, look at, for example, all the people who are currently in, in jail. I, I hope that we don't go down that road. But nonetheless, in a sense, I consider them martyrs. And I have a tremendous uh, respect for, for the people who've, who've been the cannabis activists uh, for years prior to us even touching uh, a joint or a bud or, or anything along those lines. Um, I, I think mm. that people need to respect, uh, and this is not a respect, a call respect for us, but anybody who's involved with the cannabis uh, movement, have respect for them, but also consider becoming one yourself in a sense. You know, now is a time, I think the, the, the public opinion is also swaying in, in a positive direction. I think it's a, it's a time for people who are in the closet, who have that passion about cannabis uh, in their hearts, but uh, they're still scared to, uh, to take that, uh, that step out of the closet. I think now is a time to start doing so because we need more people who have the courage to stand up for what they believe in to, to start talking, to open up the conversations with people, to, to raise awareness that everything that we've been led to believe it's a lie, and so perhaps uh, I'm sorry. I'm taking your uh, your thunder here. I shouldn't be talking so much, but uh, just you've just been touching on so many hot issues here. I, I just couldn't resist uh, actually just sharing a few of those thoughts. Um, no, but no, no, that, that, that's that's fine, um, uh, Bobby. You've you've said it incredibly well, and I we 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 all of us, in fact, even people who don't know it yet, all of us owe a tremendous debt of gratitude uh, to the martyrs who've who've come before us including the people who are in jail and, in fact, the people who have died. Uh, in fact, I was, I was meeting with a grower here in the state of Washington uh, a couple weeks back, and a, he's a gentleman in his late 50s uh, who has been involved with cannabis ever since he was a, a teenager. And he mentioned that in, in high school he was one of 13 friends who were uh, very active in, in cannabis and really stepping out over the line. And, uh, you know, many or most of them involved in, involved in growing cannabis. And what happened, and over the years, of those 13 friends that he was one of that group of 13, all of them have died except for this one man who has left. And um, it was just a really profound moment to hear that. I mean, we don't realize what people have, have gone through Died before. in the line because, of cannabis-related uh, incidents? Well, I, I didn't ask for the I didn't ask for details during that conversation. I didn't want to, you know, out of I don't know why I was I was afraid to ask. Hey, you know, how exactly did they die? We were actually that that conversation was actually being recorded on video. Um, I think maybe I will follow up privately. Um, but I mean, the the I mean I don't know whether they died in jail because they were incarcerated for. For cannabisism, sorry, 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 for, for cannabis, um, or or what exactly happened? But um, it was just a very sad thing to hear. And and as far as as um, respect for for active for activists in general, um, I've got a lot of heroes in the in the activism realm. Um, for well, I I was born and raised in uh, in Berkeley, California, and and the nearby towns. Um, actually, Albany, which is a tiny little town just north of Berkeley, and Berkeley has long been a, a, a huge hotbed of, of activism and uh, leadership, not just for the country but for the entire world. I mean, the free speech movement, and then right across the bay in San Francisco, where Harvey Milk became the first uh, publicly elected official who was openly gay back in the 70s. I mean, right now that's like, oh, being openly gay, ah, oh, that's no problem. Anyone can do that. But what, what people, uh, particularly younger people uh, in this day and age in 2013 don't realize is that back in the 70s, I mean, being in the closet was seriously, you, I mean, if you stepped out of the closet, you could get beaten to death and, and seriously ostracized mm -hmm. by your own family, friends, and people were committing suicide. People who were, who were gay or, or bisexual were, were actually committing suicide. <laughs> and um, Harvey Milk's you know, stood up and stood up for what was right, fought for what was right, and was just an incredible inspiration. I was, you know, I was just a few miles away when uh, the night, the, the day that he he and Mayor Moscone were assassinated, and um, and just as a, as a 
kid growing up in Berkeley, there were, I mean, as a toddler, there were, there were all kinds of riots against the Vietnam War. And were it not for all that pressure elevating the cost of these wars of aggression abroad, um, it would make war a lot more feasible proposition uh, for the United States government, which has committed tremendous atrocities uh, against, other, against other countries. In fact, I mean, very close to home, my great-grandfather being killed during the Spanish-American War, uh, he was one of about 600,000 people who were killed during the Spanish-American War and during the Philippine insurrection which followed. The Filipinos at first greeted the Americans as liberators, and they were very shocked to, to, to find that the Americans had no intention of merely being liberators. They were there to build an empire the American Empire. And so the Filipinos um, rebelled against the Americans and it became one of the bloodiest conflicts that was not taught in the history books as I was growing up. And I think it's, it, it gets very little coverage today. But anyway, so ha having, having, um, having experienced um, activism very close to home and seeing the very positive effects, the transformational effects of activism uh, in, in, in Berkeley, California, where I went to where I did my undergraduate work and also part of my graduate work, I've had a lot of in, inspiring uh, heroes. In fact, it was only a few months ago that uh, my father and I went to a talk that, uh, that Ralph Nader gave uh, in Berkeley, an evening talk. Um, and he was talking about the need for local leadership and for people to get involved. And he talked about a number of populist issues, which are, which the majority of people in the United States are in favor of, um, but which have not yet been enacted into law, and one of those was the legalization of cannabis. And so there I am sitting in my seat listening to Ralph Nader talk and asking myself, you know, what am I doing to forward these very positive and transformative impacts on our entire society? You know, what am I doing? I'm just, you know, writing software. And, you know, working on my own entrepreneurial pursuits, which are not really going to have, at the end of the day, that big of a transformation on the planet. And so um, when this opportunity came along, you see, here's the thing. What, in, in addition to, I mean, some people look at me and say, hey, this guy wants to make a whole bunch of money off of cannabis. And it's true, but what I want to do with all but a very tiny percentage of that money, just what I need to, to live comfortably, is I want to contribute 99% of my profits, or hopefully even more than that, uh, if, if it gets into the billions, which I expect it will. Uh, I want to contribute... And I wish you success much. with those ambitions. Thank you, thank you. I want to contribute the vast majority um, of, that, of those profits to the cause of eradicating world hunger. <clears throat> and um, I have some very specific ideas about how I would like to make those contributions and in, in what specific areas. But uh, it, that for me is, that is my personal cause that I want to, I mean, in addition to the cause for cannabis itself, I also want to be a, a, a contributing force in as big a way as I can to the eradication of, of world hunger. Um, Cannabis so, seeds, uh, anybody? <laughs> because, of course, cannabis seeds are one of the most nutritious seeds on the planet as well. So just uh, ironically that uh, you can actually achieve that goal with with the project that you're working on as well, in a sense, with, with the cannabis. Uh, you know, the, the, you, you raise a really interesting point. Have you actually seen any of the numbers in terms of, like, the calories per acre that can be produced? By, by I have, actually. Cannabis? and. Uh, by the way, of course, in Canada, I don't know uh, how easily accessible it is in the States, but uh, here in our Costco's, we can even buy hemp seed. Of course, uh, shelled and broken up so it can't be grown, but for uh, for nutritional purposes. It's absolutely delicious. It's uh, absolutely healthy. It's uh, I, I eat it all the time. And... Uh Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, now, now I can. Now you can. Okay. You just disappeared for a few seconds. Yeah, okay, just, a, just a, an outstanding opportunity for uh, for uh, for farmers. Of course, they they have multiple multiple products that they can sell 
from one crop. They have, of course, you know, have the seeds, which is, you know, absolutely nutritious food uh, for, for, for human consumption. You've got medicine. You've got fuel. You've got fiber for, uh, for building anything from cars, houses, paper to canvas jeans, uh, you know, like your clothing. Uh, there, there's so many, uh, so many industrial and commercial uses to it that uh, from, from, a, from a farmer's perspective, I, I think farmers should be overjoyed looking forward and pushing the agenda to have uh, cannabis or hemp rather, well, it's the same thing, uh, legalized, because from one acre, I, I'm not aware of any other crop that they couldn't have as much return from, from anything else, because they could oh, sell yeah. the whole plant. Yeah, yeah, and, and also it's, it's a plant that, that has so many cycles uh, throughout the year, and it's such a hardy plant that can grow in, in a variety of different conditions. So, Without pesticides, so it doesn't require all those fertilizers as well. It's uh, it's just unbelievable what this plant uh, can do. It's it's considered the uh, the, the most uh, useful plant on the planet, and I, I'm not even aware of what would be uh, close to even being considered second to it uh, in many mm. respects. Man, hey Bobby, since you talked about the, the the food and nutritional aspects, you've actually made me hungry. Can we take a can I take like a couple minute food break and just chow down a little bit here? Um, okay, uh, perhaps uh, what we can do is not much longer. There's only a couple little questions here. Um, I have to uh, be gone by 3 o'clock here. What time? Oh, yeah, no, no, let, 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 let's plow uh, ahead. Let's plow ahead. You, you go ahead. You go ahead. Oh. Okay, um, we're, we're almost done anyways. Um, by the way, just for what it's worth, uh, you've said so many wonderful things uh, on the call already. Uh, I'm just so tempted. I wish we had a few hours to talk because I'm actually really enjoying this conversation just for personal reasons as well. <laughs> uh, Me too. Me too, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you too. But um, anyhow, for uh, for our listeners, I'm, I'm sure one thing that uh, they're they're kind of keen to to find out about, um, or at least uh, to perhaps one day even experience themselves. I know I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you, you talk about opening up uh, these stores, uh, all these retail locations, uh, with uh, with the retail brand that you're establishing uh, in, in those two states. But eventually, I'm sure it'll be uh, throughout the entire country and hopefully internationally. I actually look forward to walking to a Diego Pais here uh, here in Ottawa. But Thank you. Thank you. What what can we expect? Uh, like you mentioned, of course, the idea of having this building that you're going to purchase rather than lease for a number of reasons, and of course, you talked about having this outstanding art architect to design it. So I'm getting the impression here that this is not just a, a retail location that you just uh, walk in, look behind a glass counter, grab what you want, and out you go. I have a feeling this is going to be an exquisite experience in and of itself, just to walk into your uh, your retail locations. So can you just tell us, first of all? What do you envision uh, a retail location to to look like? What would be the experience of someone coming in, purchasing? Talk about the product. Like, what kind of an experience would it be to actually be your customer? Absolutely. So, first of all, they will walk into a place which is architecturally beautiful, and that beautiful that beauty will actually manifest itself in a way where. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the call, I apologize for the interruption, but unfortunately from the original call we had lost the tail end of the uh, the call with uh, Jamin, and I know that there was a lot of fabulous information, and in fact it uh, really took a very positive upswing uh, towards the end of the call. However, the last part of the call was lost. Now a month later we're uh, doing this call together because we've discovered this uh, uh, this, this missing content here. I uh, apologize for any inconvenience uh, to, uh, to Jamin, of course, uh, and of course uh, for for listeners, but we're going to uh, resume uh, where more or less we we left off. Uh, and so, of course, Jamin, you're still on the line here, and thank you so very much for agreeing to do this second call to uh, to do a retake of this uh, this portion of the call. So, what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this call is about Diego Pacer. Uh, what is the user experience uh, that someone who would be coming into one of your retail locations would be expecting? Of course, we're going to talk about the product uh, itself, uh, the atmosphere of uh, the retail locations, uh, the production facilities, and, uh, and of course, a few other little, little questions that will uh, come up as well. But, uh, Jamin, can you just uh, tell us a little bit, what would a, a person experience when they come into a Diego Pace there for the first time? What is the... the, the the, the experience that they should be experiencing when they walk into one of your stores. Uh, of course, you have 22 locations that I understand that you were mentioning that uh, you're planning on uh, starting out with. Can Correct. you just talk a little yep. bit about your stores? 
Yeah, absolutely. So when a customer, first of all, it's great to be back with you, Bobby, and absolutely no worries. Delighted to, to, to redo the conversation, and hello, everyone. Um, Thank you very so, much. You're welcome. So when, uh, when a customer enters a Diego Payuser store, the what we are committed that each and every customer have an experience of being honored and respected and cared for no matter where they are at in their process of learning about cannabis. It could literally be somebody who, you know, just got off a plane from another country and has never even heard of cannabis before. Not that there are a lot of such people, but even if they're even if they are there are um they will be uh, very gently um invited to look at some information and materials and interactive displays which tell them all about what is cannabis and this is actually a really interesting point because even for people who know a lot about cannabis or think they know a lot about cannabis um most people in the United States uh and I assume the same is true of Canada Bobby uh, mm -hmm. Most people have some mix of the truth and a bunch of lies, which have been promulgated uh, by various interest groups. So, mm -hmm. um, even so, myself in my own journey in the past year and a half, I've really had to look at cannabis uh, from a from what I call a beginner's mind. And so, we really want to recreate um, the experience of learning about cannabis and all of its various aspects um, from, a, from a clean slate for those who are interested in, in embarking on that journey. So we want to visit to a Diego Payser store to be first and foremost uh, about education, learning about cannabis, learning about the different varieties of cannabis that mm -hmm. we carry, and uh, learning about safety, learning about uh, what are the effects of cannabis, uh, both positive and in some in some circumstances, obviously, uh, you don't want to do cannabis and then you know get in your car and drive or operate machinery or be responsible for you know a half dozen uh, small children, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we want to educate about all those different aspects. And so again, getting back to the customer, no matter where they're at. If it's someone who's been who's used cannabis for a number of years and knows quite a bit about it, or someone who's a first-time user, and we want to actually uh, create and encourage a sense of community among the associates working at the store, the guests who come into the store, and among the guests themselves. In other words, our interactive displays. We want those for, to be opportunities for people to connect and share. I mean, just like if you go into any museum or trade show or whatever, you're always mm -hmm. going to find people who know a lot about a specific topic and are actually excited to share what they know with complete strangers, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine walking up to an interactive display and there is someone there who knows quite a bit about, about cannabis. And, and Bobby, as you and I know and probably most of our listeners know, People who do know something about cannabis and have experience with it, um, much more often than not, are very, very passionate about it and are mm. delighted to share what they know about it. I mean, it's just like you'd share with a good friend uh, about a great movie or documentary that you've just seen or a great book that you've just read or mm -hmm. a beautiful hike that you just went on. And um, because, in fact, all... All of those are actually really interesting uh, parallels to me personally mm -hmm. because of the fact that cannabis provides you with such a wonderful, new, and beautiful perspective on whatever it is that you are dealing with uh, mm -hmm. in your life. So just to, just to give an example, and Bobby, let me know if I'm kind of rambling off on tangents. No, actually, I, I was taking a mental note to ask you to uh, to go on this rambling because I remember in the previous uh, the call, unfortunately, we, we lost a little bit about this, uh, and I was absolutely uh, inspired with with how you actually discussed this. So please, feel free to go off on, on this tangent, and I'll bring you back at some point later on, but uh, th th this is very important what you're about to say. Please. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, and in fact, it's actually a good thing, probably, that 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 portion of our last interview got erased, uh, because what I'm about to tell you is something that I couldn't have told you a month ago, which is mm-hmm. that um, in the last uh, week there was an, there was a, a situation with several people in my life who I'm close to, where there was a lack of unity and where we absolutely needed to build unity. It was critically important. And there were all kinds of misunderstandings and words which had been said in the past, um, which had sort of created a, a sort of a, a rift uh, between uh, people. And so what I did was, it, it, it was just, it was quite serendipitous. Um, I enjoyed uh, some fine uh, organic sativa, a variety that a, a good friend of mine uh, has grown. Mm-hmm. And I found that while experiencing the wonderful effects of that particular variety of the plant, um, I was I was completely uninhibited in getting right to the core of the matter and being a very strong stand for unity and for forgiveness and for all of us coming together and working together and sharing and making it happen. And over the course of, of, uh, of several days and having conversations with a number of individuals who were involved in this particular uh, situation, um, I found that that particular variety of cannabis was incredibly powerful. Not powerful in the sense of, oh, it's got a very high percentage of THC, which for me is not at all correlated with, with great cannabis. It's just mm-hmm. it's simply one factor. We, we can talk more about that later. Okay. Uh, excuse me. But, um, but I found this particular variety of, of, of a sativa uh, was just amazing for me to really connect with unity and the power of unity and the importance of unity among people. Um, and I was able to connect with that at a whole, in, in a way that I had not ever previously. I mean, I've always been one who seeks to build unity among teams, among family members, among mm-hmm. friends. Um, but this, like, bumped it up to a whole new level. And so just as I'm passionately ex- sharing with you my own experiences with this particular variety, what I want is for people of all different backgrounds and of all different levels of experience to share uh, with friends and even complete strangers, if they, if they so desire, uh, to share about what their experiences are uh, with cannabis and with particular varieties of cannabis. Because it's, it's one of those things that it just, it just beckons to be shared with people. And so I want for people, even people who have not even made up their mind about whether they will ever uh, try cannabis, um, I want for them to, be, to feel completely comfortable and at ease walking into a Diego Payser store and learning about what cannabis is because it, we're committed that it be the best place for anyone to go to actually learn about cannabis. What is it all about? What's all this, what's all the commotion about, right? Mm -hmm. You've got people saying it's a great thing, other people saying it should be illegal. Let me, let me learn about this and let me talk to some people who are passionate about it and let me make up my own mind, right? So there will, one thing for sure, there will absolutely be zero pressure for anyone to buy anything in any of our stores. There there will be no need. There will be so much uh, interest uh, just naturally on the part of those who do want to purchase uh, our product. So we're going to have no trouble uh, moving product. Uh, But we want this to be a much more inclusive environment than just serving our our paying customers. We consider everyone our customer, uh, whether or not they're, they're purchasing any of our products or not. And so I hope I'm conveying, Bobby, the, the sense of, of unity and actually community and sharing and collaboration. Uh, because well, there's, 
Yeah. There's, there's yeah, a couple things that I'm, I'm inspired already. Uh, of course, there's the the main topic, and of course the tangent topic. I want to touch on both. Uh, of course, I'm very impressed that you're dedicating your retail locations and your stores and your business not just for the pursuit of you know selling and moving product, which of course I know that uh, that's part of all businesses. You have to uh, uh, you have to do that. But I'm really inspired by the way that you're doing that where you're actually providing essentially an education uh, for, for this new budding industry. I mean, I'll use that pun uh, intendedly. And, of, uh, and of course, uh, for, for educating the minds of people who, who've, been bought, who've bought into the, the propaganda and for, for, of course, learning what cannabis really can do in terms of uh, the recreational aspects, the medicinal aspects, uh, explaining the sativa versus indica strains, and, and a lot of other uh, things, kind of like uh, understanding the distinctions between fine wines. Uh, there's a, actually a lot. Uh, there's a lot more depth to cannabis than fine wine. So if anybody is a wine connoisseur, uh, I'm, and also a cannabis connoisseur, I'm sure you can appreciate the fact that there's a lot more depth to uh, to uh, to studying cannabis in that respect. So um, kind of like the idea of going to a fine wine store. The, the the people who I would imagine working at your store would be able to talk about the nuances of the the flavors, but also there's a, an added richness that alcohol doesn't have because with alcohol you have only one experience. You know, when you drink a glass, you know the effect it's going to have. Maybe it'll have a different taste, but the effect will be pretty much uh, uniform. But what you spoke about is, of course, that there's a particular strain that your friend uh, provided for you, the sativa, that had this unifying effect. And I think this is uh, really important for people to realize that um, cannabis, certain strains in particular, have a wonderful Social quality. Of course, a lot of people drink alcohol together. However, alcohol, in a sense, makes you silly and stupid in a sense. However, cannabis can have a marvelous effect of really opening up the hearts and minds and allowing people to connect on profound, deep levels. And that's what I'm hearing what you're, what you're trying to say, is that you are able to connect with these people who you've had uh, harsh words with perhaps in the past or, or differences of opinions, and you're able to let these... Uh, these hard feelings go and able to connect and heal even uh, these uh, these relationships as well so so i think that's absolutely fantastic what you were saying uh and now back to of course um to your stores i i have to say from the previous conversation that we've had and of course in this one i am just blown away with your vision of the the service that you're you're planning on offering your customers i i'm i'm just really impressed Thank you, thank you, Bobby. It's well, it's the opportunity of a lifetime because the way I see it, <coughs> excuse me, we are um, we are coming out of a prolonged, uh, what I refer to as a dark age for cannabis, mm -hmm. where the truth was buried, lies were promulgated, it was made illegal, people were, were prosecuted and persecuted for um, for growing it and consuming it. And now, with the trend towards legalization, which is building steam literally every week, it's palpable, mm -hmm. the uh, the increase in momentum, um, we are at the dawn of a renaissance of cannabis. Because when I say renaissance, there was a previous golden age of cannabis that the world enjoyed and experienced. And it was the age of Diego Pellicer, where he was able to grow uh, thousands of acres of this wonderful plant and use it for, in his case, wonderful industrial purposes of making rope and burlap sacks and other textiles. Mm -hmm. And um, and also from the period 1850 to 1900, uh, cannabis was used as an ingredient in about half of the medicines sold in the United States. And so um, it's had this wonderful golden path and then from about 1930 to until uh, December 2012, it was the Dark Ages. And mm -hmm. the reason I mentioned December 2012, that's when it became legal to possess and consume uh, in the states of Washington and Colorado, which is a huge first step. Of course, there's a lot more ground to cover. But So I went off on a small tangent there. Let me bring it back to our stores. Okay. So I, I feel incredibly uh, blessed. Uh, and honored to have the opportunity of creating a, a retail chain in this new era of legalized cannabis. Because in the dark ages, no brands existed because no brands were permitted to exist. If anyone tried to build a brand, they would get squashed. 
Mm -hmm. uh, by the by the by the federal government or depending on which on what specific agency. Um, mm -hmm. But there was no freedom, and so now that that there is freedom, there's a trend towards legalization, which we're we're betting will continue. This gives us a, an amazing opportunity to create one of the great brands in this industry and to be one of the companies that takes this amazing product to the world and to to many different facets of, of society um, who otherwise would not have been able to experience it or if, or if they were to experience it, would they would have to go through black market or gray market channels mm -hmm. in order to experience it. Which And so... It's uh, it's something that I I can't take credit for uh, this opportunity being presented to us, but I can uh, certainly make the most of it. And so, creating stores which really honor the product and honor people um, is uh, uh, it's the obvious for me. It's the obvious thing to do. I wouldn't do it any other way. And coincid and coincidentally. It will also be the way that we'll maximize our own uh, success as a business because it will be one of those businesses, one of those places that people absolutely love. They don't just like it. They will love it. They'll love a visit to Diego store to learn about even, if it, even, even experienced cannabis growers and users. I mean, it's a great place to connect with other growers and learn about what they've been doing and what kind of new products they've been developing. And what the effects of the see it's a constantly evolving plant because you have breeders who are mm -hmm. constantly crossing uh, a, a father of certain genetics with a mother of other genetics, and of course anyone who has siblings as I do uh, knows that um, take the same parents and the kids are going to be very very different both from the parents and from one another. Kind of like uh, bottles of wine from different years, uh, even from the same grower, uh, the, the qualities can be different. So I know that you, you're going to be having a number of suppliers or a number of growers, and of course, uh, from year to year, uh, your products uh, may, uh, may change a little bit, and of course, uh, you'll always be uh, going after the highest quality uh, of, of products, but uh, I think this is absolutely fantastic what you're doing. Now, just out of curiosity, uh, Jamin, are, do you have any intentions, uh, and now I realize that the, the laws, of course, are going to be uh, the, the number one uh, uh, determining factor of whether or not this would happen at all, but have you thought about uh, perhaps uh, introducing uh, a portion of the, the the locations to being a vapor lounge or, or cafe, so to speak, where people can actually uh, communally or as groups of people to indulge in this, much much like a bar in a sense or, or a coffee shop, uh, so that of course they can experience the the absolute exquisite uh, cannabis that you have to offer, but also indulge in the the social aspects of, of connecting with others. And you're mentioning, of course, other growers uh, talking to other growers and uh, other other people in the industry connecting with the others in your lo locations. So have you thought about uh, incorporating that as part of your your model, or is that uh, something that you're thinking about uh, depending on legal situations in the future? Any any thoughts about that? You know, that's really, really interesting, Bobby. Um, I've got a lot of thoughts about that. Number one, in principle, I love the idea of creating public spaces where people can enjoy this amazing plant and share those experiences with other people. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the other hand, uh, particularly for people who haven't used cannabis before or are a first-time user, the very first, uh, you know, one or two or three or, or up to ten times that a person uses cannabis um, will be very different from, you know, their 20th or 50th time using the product. And so, um, for example, uh, as I think I may have told you on a previous discussion, that uh, one of the very first times that I used cannabis, I ended up laughing so hard that my stomach was just hurting so bad that I had to dive on the floor and roll it off. Right. Feel free to explain yeah. that because uh, I know that that was a uh, deleted or the uh, part of the the lost portion. Oh. So. Yeah. So yeah, no, I was I was I was with some dear friends and I had eaten uh, a portion of a of a cannabis brownie, mm -hmm. and when the effects kicked in and we were uh, <laughs> we were we were just having a great conversation and there was a, a woman in the group who. Uh, was absolutely not a cannabis user and 
was under the impression that it was somehow a gateway drug. And here I was under the effects of, of cannabis in a very positive way, mm -hmm. explaining to her that cannabis is a great thing. And I was laughing and I, and I, and I saw the sort of, you know, very concerned look on her face as she's watching me laugh and enjoy life in a whole different way. And, um, it just became hilariously funny to me, and it became almost like a, a vicious cycle of the more that I laughed, the more concerned that she got, and the more hilarious all this became to me, because for me, it was nothing but goodness, and it is nothing but goodness. And yet, here's this person who has been uh, a victim of all of these lies which have been spread throughout the world about cannabis, and so she's looking at me and my experience with a very particular optic. And um, it was just absolutely hilarious. And so I ended up rolling on the floor and just l having so much fun. I mean, it brings a smile to my face just thinking back to that one particular moment. And so um, so, 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 bottom line, um, my, my concern about having a public space for that is that you're going to have people who are going to be having what – can amount to very personal experiences with the product, and is that something that you want to do in a public space? Because again, you have to consider where we are at this particular stage in history, right now, where you have so many people who either don't use cannabis, have never used cannabis, or the last time they used it was 20 years ago, and they only did a little bit of it because they thought that they were probably damaging their brain, and so just to be social, they took and of course a they of didn't inhale or anything like that. Exactly. And so, <laughs> so at this particular time, we need to be responsible for the particular moment in history where we find ourselves, mm -hmm. where that is the case. And so I think it calls for a particular level of responsibility around how we introduce cannabis to the world, right? And for me, uh, at this particular moment in time, I think, and I'm, but I'm glad we're discussing it. I have these conversations from time to time because it's a very important topic. But at this moment in time, I personally believe that the best way that Diego Pellicer can serve the country and the world um, and all of the people who will be visiting our stores is to provide is to provide a social experience which is all about learning about and sharing about the product um, and holding off at least for the for the time being on providing this sort of you know public space where people can enjoy the product because you can imagine the effects of just like that that woman who I shared about a friend of mine um, mm -hmm. where uh, she's observing something through a particular lens, and that lens includes the distortions, the lies, which she has unfortunately bought into, that, oh, the cannabis is a gateway drug, and, you know, you start with that, and then you move up to heroin, and then your life is finished. You know, um, if she is looking at the world through that lens, and let's say that she goes to a Diego Pacer store where we have a bar, uh, a mm -hmm. cannabis bar, for lack of a better word, and she sees someone laughing hysterically, and possibly even rolling on the floor, right? Then that could serve to reinforce those negative impressions, those lies that she has been told. And she's like, yes, it is the devil's, it's the devil's weed. It makes you crazy. And I could just imagine that person, you know, going and killing someone. I mean, of course, nothing, nothing could be further from the truth, as you and I know. Cannabis, if, if any, it, it's, Cannabis, it creates these, um, this, these amazing sensations, as you were describing, of unity and love and peace and openness and mm -hmm. non-competitiveness, non which is just, just amazing. Alcohol seems to do the opposite. It makes it and, crazy, actually. Really, in, in a sense, if you think about it, alcohol should be relabeled with the reefer madness stereotypes in, in, in many respects. Alcohol yeah. makes it crazy. Alcohol does a lot of the effects that reefer madness is... Uh, alluded to. Anyhow, sorry for interrupting. Please continue. No, no, no. That's okay. That's okay. So, so, so. Bottom line, in my personal view, and this will evolve over time because things are evolving so quickly. I mean, in any renaissance, mm -hmm. you know, we're 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 shedding the chains of the dark ages pretty quickly. So it could be that you know, in a couple of years, I've got a whole, or even a couple of months, I may have a whole different viewpoint on this. Um, I certainly hope to, uh, because. 
I mean, it's it would be such a wonderful thing if people. I mean, because like today, I would think nothing of going into a pub, you know, where there's a great soccer match on TV, and you know, going with a friend or going alone and enjoying the soccer match and enjoying a couple of pints of beer, and enjoying sort of the sense of community and celebration and and happiness, which you know, which goes hand in hand with such a context, right? Mm -hmm. I would think nothing of it, and it would be great. You know, yes. of course, if you know, if if the place seemed rowdy or something like that, well, then I probably wouldn't walk in in the first place. Or if it became rowdy over the course of the game because someone drank too much, I would probably leave. Um, or you know, try to befriend them and calm them down or whatever I could do that was positive. Um, but, but I guess uh, essentially, people already have an understanding of the effects of alcohol, and there's essentially no stigma uh, attached to it. And people go into a bar if they see people uh, acting drunk, uh, they, they're already expecting that uh, that behavior more or less. So it's not unusual per se. However, people, what you're saying, of course, with, with this lady, uh, their first impressions may not necessarily be positive because of the lenses that they're looking through with the uh, the eyes of the prohibition. Uh, that they've been uh, tainted with. But I just have to say, Jamin, for for what it's worth, of course, I've always, I've been very impressed with a number of the, the answers and responses that you've given throughout the previous interview, even this one today. But again, with what you're saying here, this this really impresses me with uh, the, the, the maturity of your perspective and your the, the thought-out answer. Of course, I was anticipating uh, something along the lines of, uh, that's a great idea, that'd be uh, wonderful for whatever reason you would either do it or wouldn't do it. But your answer uh, was probably the best that I could have anticipated because you weren't just sort of thinking of what's best for the for the user experience or for even for from the business perspective. You were actually uh, coming from the, uh, the the responsible perspective of thinking of what effects would this have on the, the broader, uh, the bigger picture of the legalization processes, the the, 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 stigmas, uh, the, the current stigmas, of course, that people have, and the perspectives uh, that uh, this would uh, uh, portray for people. So, so I think that you, you're demonstrating that, of course, you have a deep understanding of cannabis. You have a, a love that's, that's obvious to, uh, to my ears, at the least, and I'm sure many other people hear that uh, through, uh, through the words that you're saying, but you definitely have a mature and responsible attitude uh, for how you're sharing this with the world. And I have to say, that impresses me about you, for what it's worth. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. No, that, 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 that's worth a lot. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've evolved and grown quite a bit over the years, and I, I think this is probably the perfect time in my life. I'm 44. I'll turn 45 in a month. And um, so I've... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly maturing. It'll it'll never end the process of maturing. Just ask my fiance; she'll she'll definitely attest to that. Um, but I think if I were if I were uh, ten or twenty years younger, um, I would I would have a whole different perspective on it. I'd probably be looking at it much more from the optic of a business opportunity and how do we maximize that. Um, but uh, I'm. But you're definitely expressing a lot of social responsibility as well with your with your actions, and 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 there's a lot of care and, and compassion and and uh, and and love that comes through uh, with what you're saying. Thank you. So you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Bobby. Yeah. Well, you know, th th this is this is the thing. I mean, it's like for the first time, I'm in an industry and a movement that I am just absolutely excited beyond words about, and I get to meet people like you. Every day and every week. You're, I mean, you're particularly amazing. I mean, just the connection Thank we've you. had over the phone without even, you know, meeting each other. But it's it's like we've got this common bond, which is a love for this a love for this amazing plant, which we want to share with the world. And so it's like we're in, instantly on the same team, and um, it's just so absolutely exciting. It's just it's just an incredible journey. And it's a journey to uh, support and promote and uh, find, discover the most responsible, um, loving ways of reintroducing this amazing plant to the majority of the world who are unfortunately blocked, whether psychologically or legally or, or socially, but they're blocked from having access to it and from enjoying it properly. Um, and so um, 
the uh, you know it, so it's it's not just about it's not just like any other great product whether it's a great software product or a great car or a great building material where it's where it's the product in and of itself and what's possible with the product which are the which are the ends that we're that we're promoting um, it is a product which in which in and of itself helps people to create whole new possibilities for themselves, for their lives, for their loved ones, for their businesses. I mean, it's a, it's a product which is uh, an amazing, which can be used as an amazing tool, an amazing vehicle to go on journeys. Um, you can be sitting in your own living room and go on an amazing journey with friends, with loved ones, and go to places in your imagination with your creativity um, mm -hmm. or go to places socially in terms of connecting at a very deep spiritual level uh, mm -hmm. in ways that you otherwise may never have been able to experience. Or in, as in the case that I, I was describing uh, several minutes ago about creating and building unity. I mean, what a beautiful thing, right? So it's it's something where uh, it's it, it it's a passion that I don't think would be possible for me to have in the vast majority of uh, of industries of, mm -hmm. of products and services that I could be uh, developing and marketing. Um, this, among all of those, is something that's just particularly exciting and meaningful. Um, uh, well. Yeah, go ahead. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Jamie, for what it's worth, uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about the products in, in just a moment. But I, before we move over to that topic, I want to just just express this for what it's worth. I was not a, uh, initially. I wasn't going to mention this at all, um, but this has been in the back of my mind ever since uh, the beginnings of, uh, of interacting with you as well. Um, I, I'm going to say this for what it's worth. I, of course, I didn't say it in the, the previous interview, but uh, a month later, I'm going to say this for what it's worth. Uh, I've, I've, of course, I've just mentioned to you how enamored and impressed I am with you. And I, I'm going to admit something. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a Linux fan, <laughs> for, for what sure, it's worth. So sure. you're probably uh, see, uh, seeing where I'm probably already mentally heading with this. Uh, when I originally contacted you, of course, you're, you're a former Microsoft executive. I really did not have any... I really didn't know who you'd be, what your personality would be like. And I have to say that from the very first time that we actually connected on the phone and spoke uh, the first few words, I actually have to admit that you, you shattered my preconceived notions of who and what you'd be all about. And uh, you have actually are much more open. You're much more... Um, I, I'm actually going to say this for what it's worth. I, I definitely get the sense that you're a very heart-centered person. For, for what it's worth. Mm. So, I mean, like, there, there's, there's a lot of positive connotations. I can go deeper into it. I don't want to get too, too metaphysical. Um, you're, you're definitely uh, someone who's got their heart in the right place for what it's worth. And all my expectations of, uh, of everything that I thought you'd be uh, doing with this business was literally uh, out the window. I have to say that uh, I initially came with the uh, with the notion that you're you've come up with this great business idea you had the the creativity inspired by that good bong rip uh that <laughs> that you should do this uh, this company uh, Dago Pace there uh but but literally i see that you're not doing this as um as a money grab let's uh, create a create a business for uh, in, in this booming industry now of course this is a great business in the booming industry uh so you know you're you're definitely positioning yourself well but i have to say that i'm really really, really in, impressed on, on a number of different uh, levels and in, in a few different ways that you're, you're doing this not just as a business venture, which of course it is a business venture, but you're also doing this as a service. You're, at, you're providing a, a great a service to a greater good uh, towards this, uh, this cause in, in so many different respects. And I, I have to say that you should be commended for, uh, for everything that you're doing. So just... Uh, if you want to say a few words about that, uh, just uh, sure, just wanted sure. to put that out there. But uh, want to talk about your products as well. But, uh, bef but before we talk about your products, do you have anything that you wanted to say about what I just said? Or absolutely, absolutely. I, first of all, thank you. And and second of all, as far as the social service, if there were, if I were doing this as a as a nonprofit, I'd be doing it with equal passion, um, mm -hmm. because 
it is, you know, it's first and foremost a service to society. Now, it's interesting. A lot of money will be generated uh, by the business, obviously, and um, that's that's very exciting as well for me personally. I want to uh, contribute the vast majority of, of my profits that I make from the business to uh, the efforts to end world hunger. So uh, there's it's 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 a doubly incredible opportunity to, uh, on the one hand, help reintroduce the world to this amazing plant of cannabis, and at the same mm -hmm. time take the profits from that and solve uh, one of the world's great, great unsolved problems, which is how do we ensure that everyone is adequately nourished? And ironically, the uh, the solution to that is in the business uh, that you're doing in and of itself, cannabis is the answer for uh, for ending world hunger as well. Amazing. And we'll, we'll have to talk more about that. I need to, I need to delve Absolutely. more into the, those aspects of it. But, but thank you, Bobby. Thank you. You're very welcome. So regarding the uh, the products uh, themselves, uh, I want to, and also just because, of course, there was a couple of things that were mentioned uh, over the past couple of minutes, I'll just uh, put a little mental bookmark here uh, for the conversation as well. One of the things that I'd like to at least touch upon is because, of course, you have a lot of experience in the business world, uh, and, of course, you're, 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 you're doing a great business here. That is, of course, uh, providing a great service as well, but it is a business. Uh, there's a lot of people right now who need opportunities, especially in America and in many other countries around the world as well. There's a huge emerging industry. Uh, at some point, I'd like for you to just touch upon, or perhaps since I'm talking about this now, we'll, we'll reserve the, the products uh, for, for, uh, in a few more moments, but can you just uh, inspire a few of our listeners? Um, do you have any words of inspiration about uh, perhaps their entrepreneurship? Of course, uh, I remember you were speaking about entrepreneurship uh, before uh, in, in our yeah. previous interview, but just uh, just yeah. touching upon uh, this, this golden opportunity of the, or this green opportunity uh, that people should capitalize or at least think about ways that they can capitalize on it without getting themselves in trouble. So, of course, keeping, uh, keeping legal situations uh, in perspective, but, uh, yeah. but of course, how yeah, can no, they... I, uh, I, I, go ahead. To, to, yeah. Yeah, you know, great, great questions, Bobby. So, um, so first of all, um, yeah, it's true. There are a lot of people who are unemployed or underemployed, or they're employed full time at a job that they don't absolutely love. That was certainly the case for me when I was at, for most of the time that I was at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it's an opportunity to get into a business, into an industry that that you have. Uh, incredible passion for. I'm speaking to those people who have passion for it, mm -hmm. and uh, and many of those people will have passion for it that they don't know that they have passion that they will have passion for it because they haven't tried the plant or they haven't tried uh, some of the really amazing varieties of cannabis that are out there. And that was certainly the case for me uh, two years ago, and um, I hadn't tried it. Uh, it. It had been many years. And um, I simply had no idea what I was missing, and I bought into the lies that were told. And so, anyway, it's something that I think a tremendous number of people are going to be very passionate for. So for those people, it's an opportunity to do something that you just absolutely love. Now, um, and there's going to be a lot of innovation in it. There's, there has been a, a tremendous amount of innovation in breeding new varieties and uh, developing new ways to consume the product which don't require you to, to smoke it or, do, or consume it in any way that's harmful to you. Um, so those innovations will continue. Uh, as far as, the, as not getting in trouble legally, so that's, that's a really important point and it's one that we take very seriously uh, to the point that we will not uh, either inventory or sell cannabis until and unless it becomes sufficiently legal. So what we're doing now is we're, uh, we've structured our business in such a way that we can build the business, build the brand, take on incredible partners in the business, which is another point I'll touch on in a, in a moment, mm -hmm. um, all, all in such a way that we are not in violation of the law. And for us that's important because the, the government uh, the government exists, and the government exists for very good reasons, and as imperfect as the government is, um, they, the government is and can be and should be viewed as an ally and a partner in the process of moving forward and making this all legal. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, because the government is made up of individuals who hold offices with, with very 
various degrees of responsibility. And so they need to do what they perceive to be the right things, both for, both for their constituents and their office and, uh, they, and for themselves personally. So I think it's very important to have empathy for where each of, each of those players are coming from. And to basically, so f and for our company, um, the best way that we can do that is to say, hey, look, we are absolutely playing by the rules, and we will always play by the rules, and we, want to, we would love to have some say uh, in the development of the rules, and so we're doing that through the right channels. Um, but, you know, we're not your enemy, and we don't view you as our enemy. We're, we're in this together, right? We're going to come out of the Dark Ages into the Renaissance together. Um, so that's, that's, I'm just sharing a bit from, from my own perspective. There are other folks involved in the industry for many years um, who have a bit of a different perspective. And um, again, it gets back to unity. Um, we all need to work together on this. That's my personal view and that's my commitment is that as a country, as a world, uh, that all people uh, who are at least interested in this topic will engage in a way that builds unity and builds understanding and brings important truths to light. Um, so, I think I, I think I've said enough on that. Now, yeah. getting back, getting back. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, you're, you're sort of uh, yeah. bringing yourself back on topic here. So go ahead. Sure, sure, sure. Now, on to an on to a very, a very uh, important topic, which is that of partnerships. Um, the, I was incredibly pleased to learn that as we went around talking with people and um, identifying the best possible people who could work for our business because of their expertise, whether it's with the law or with real estate or with marketing um, or finance or whatever aspects, I found that a remarkably high percentage of those people use cannabis. And have used it for years. I mean, here we are looking for the very best people in the Seattle area who can possibly partner with us, having no expectation that such accomplished, powerful individuals would would uh, would use cannabis. Can I just and, uh, you know, can I just interject yeah, yeah. here uh, for a second, James, just for what it's worth? Sure, um, I, I remember uh, hearing this uh, this point uh, raised. Uh, it was not part of the summit, so I just want to put this here uh, since it's relevant. That. A number of companies, of course, you know, they've been doing drug testing uh, policies, and of course, uh, they have uh, been drug testing even their executives and their creative marketing staff. And ironically, uh, particularly in, in jobs that require creativity, whether it be, you know, like from architecture to various different kinds of design to to, to marketing, um, cannabis, of course, as you yourself have uh, have uh, discussed uh, in the previous uh, portion of the interview, that it augments your creativity. And in a sense, uh, the cannabis users actually do provide a, a valuable service to a company. Of course, those who use it responsibly, I, I should just uh, mention that uh, as well, those who use it responsibly do have access to, uh, to creativity and insights that other people who don't use cannabis might not use. And so, of course, some of the companies that have been drug testing and, of course, firing people uh, based on uh, cannabis have actually been cutting off some of the potential talent that might have been extremely valuable assets to them in, in the first place. And just based on what you're saying, a lot of these, uh, these, these talented, uh, gifted people uh, are, of course, cannabis users. And there, there's a bit of a correlation there, especially when, uh, when you listen to what uh, Dr. Uh, Bob Melamy uh, talks about how uh, the, uh, people who are naturally cannabis uh, or cannabinoid or endocannabinoid endowed individuals um, are, make a lot of contributions, which I won't get into right now. But uh, for what it's worth, uh, it, there's there's positive aspects that can of course spill over into into the business world as well. Of course, used responsibly, uh, so you're not being stoned at work, of course. But uh, but nonetheless, touching on that creative aspects can actually provide valuable insights for companies and for individuals as well. Absolutely. For, yeah. No. 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 Absolutely. So <laughs> that's that's one of the really exciting things about it, and um, you know, in terms of of promoting cannabis to, to the world mm -hmm. and and shedding light on what cannabis truly is and its and its amazing properties. Uh, the point I was making was that for an aspiring entrepreneur or an actual entrepreneur uh, in cannabis at this time, you're going to find that as you reach out 
to highly accomplished people, creative people, people who have built uh, their own businesses very successfully, you're going to be very pleasantly surprised to find that a very large number of these people are cannabis users and are true believers because they've experienced it themselves mm-hmm. ongoingly. And uh, so that was just a, r- a really, a really great, pleasant surprise. But it, but most of them have done it uh, quietly for the past several years and have gotten into the habit of being very quiet about it mm-hmm. because, you know, who wants trouble with the law? Nobody, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's kind of like, you know, it, it literally is coming out of the dark ages yeah. and, uh, you know, being able to enjoy something that uh, publicly and much more openly uh, than than we've ever ha- had the opportunity to do before. We have to remember this is uh, this is omnipresent. I mean, there's a lot of cannabis that's moving around uh, the world. You know, throughout the United States, throughout Canada, throughout many other countries, and of course, it's uh, there's there's a lot of people who are in their closets and they're the privacy of their own home. You, you'd be shocked if you if you knew uh, your neighbors and your friends. Uh, they're actually doing it. They don't tell you, but they're actually doing it. And, of course, there's a lot of benefits to it as well. Now, uh, Jim, and I just notice the time. I want to, of course, uh, be mindful of uh, your time because I know that you have other commitments as well. Uh, so just want to just uh, really touch on uh, the product at least uh, before we move on. But, uh, of course, regarding the people for the entrepreneurship aspect, I just want to, I guess, perhaps uh, uh, to end it with uh, do what you love, the money will follow, and especially at this time with uh, with the green rush, as uh, some people are calling it, the the pop- to calm boom uh, this is a this is a golden opportunity and definitely something that uh, is worth exploring and as Jamin has been pointing out of course be very mindful of the laws and uh, only do things that are sufficiently legal to do but uh, definitely investigate uh, those opportunities further um, but Jamin of course one of the things that a lot of people you, you've actually inspired in, in many respects uh, and for myself as well uh, it's it's difficult for for many of us to get quality cannabis. Uh, some of the strains that you're talking about, uh, it, it just uh, it's just tantalizing, m- mouth watering. Just listening to you talk about some of these uh, these strains, most of us yeah. don't have access to this. Of course, I know people out in California, and, uh, 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 Colorado, and uh, Washington now do have access to this, but most of us only have access to what a dealer may have to offer, which may not be that great of a selection uh, or that high quality product. Uh, sort of. Entice us with what you envision your products. So how how are you going to be selling uh, your products? Are they going to be in loose bud form? Or are they going to be packaged? I know you also spoke about uh, you're going to be having some edibles and possibly some uh, uh, some uh, some drinks, uh, uh, cannabis uh, drinks as well. Uh, can you just talk about what you're you're setting up uh, now? Of course, I understand that you can't give away all your secrets, but what you can share about uh, the products, uh, wet or whistles a little bit uh, with uh, with anticipation of what we can look forward to one day enjoying and one of your Dago Pacer locations. Yeah, absolutely. So one one of the great things uh, about legalization is that l- let me just talk about how things exist. Today, to my understanding, and how, and my vision for how things will will work in the future. So mm-hmm. today, you've got a bunch of artists and growers. I mean, many thousands upon thousands, probably tens of thousands of artists and growers throughout the country, and each have developed their own uh, particular varieties or have used someone else's varieties based on whatever genetics they've been able to get a hold of, mm-hmm. and. Um, because of that, you've got, uh, it, and each of these artists and growers, a typical artist and grower is growing, you know, maybe a dozen plants or a few dozen plants, so a relatively small volume in the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. And so the people who have access to that one particular variety, that's a very limited number of people. It's basically people who have access to whatever dispensary or dispensaries that that grower sells to, plus whatever friends the grower mm-hmm. sells to directly, etc. And so there are some amazing, amazing varieties um, which have been talked about and written about, um, which are still very hard to actually find. And so one of the great things about legalization is it will open up the market so that a particular variety that that people love and has incredible properties will be able to be uh, developed and uh, grown at much larger scales, thus giving that amazing product 
making that amazing product available to a much, much larger population, ultimately the whole world. And um, so that's the first and most important aspect of it. The, in terms of uh, packaging and the different, the different forms the product can come in, um, I love edibles. I think edibles are a really amazing way for people to uh, introduce themselves to the product in a very gentle way. Um, and because they can control the portions very exactly in, in a way which cannot be achieved through, uh, through smoking um, because with smoking it, there are so many different factors like how long do you hold it in and you know all those sort of things. And so edibles is a, great, is a kind of a great way to start. Um, and then, of course, uh, all the way to uh, vaporizers and and hash oils, um, which are really coming on strong these days. Um, so there's just a tremendous amount of variety. But then, of course, there is the bud itself, which to me is is consuming it in its most beautiful, natural state for me personally. Um, that's how I, I love to consume it the most. And um, the... The packaging is a really important part of it. Again, getting back to uh, being mindful and responsible for this particular moment in history, uh, people's main concerns, speaking of people broadly and generally, uh, including people who do not use cannabis, uh, their main concern is safety, right? They don't want this getting in the hands of kids, and uh, they don't want, uh, you know, they just they want it to be safe. And they want it to be controlled and regulated and all that. And, and for this particular moment in history, those are all very good things. And so uh, the packaging, I believe in having prepackaged to, to achieve that, that prepackaged products, which are childproof, is really the way to go um, for this particular uh, time in history. And... Uh, in the future, as, as especially more with brownies, you want uh, childproof brownie, brownie packages. I would imagine because uh, a child will look, hmm, that looks delicious, and uh, <laughs> you don't want oh, them to I, indulge I, in those treats. Ab absolutely, and and other sweet sweet forms of uh, of edibles. Absolutely. Can, can then, I just? Oh, sorry. Yeah, please yeah. go on. I have a question, but uh, finish what you want to say first. Go ahead. Oh, sure. And then and then as far as a uh, loose bud is concerned, I know a lot of people have the enjoy the experience of, you know, being able to take some chopsticks and, you know, poke around in a jar and, and select the buds that they, that they want to purchase. Um, I think practices such as that, um, it may be best to uh, set those, those practices aside for, for at least for the time being uh, because they don't lend themselves to the kind of extreme degree of safety that I think society is demanding at this point in time. So that's one of those sort of, you know, uh, elements of give and take that I think we need to be very cognizant of. So we believe we're going to be selling fully packaged products in childproof packaging, in safe packaging, um, uh, at least for starters. And then, you know, over time, as standards evolve and as people's consciousness evolves, um, we may relax some of those constraints, but for now, we're going to go with safety first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, of course, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the exclusivity of your your products, and of course, uh, wetting the whistles of uh, how fine it is. But uh, but one one question that just uh, came up that uh, in my mind, at least uh, from what you were saying a little bit earlier, um, you mentioned, of course, that you're going to be focusing on the artisanal. Uh, market where you're going to be acquiring um, some buds or material from growers that are maybe growing just a dozen or a few dozen plants. So it's obviously low quantities. So of course that, there's a lot of variability to this and of course uh, that also implies a lot of exclusivity and of course uh, these types of growers, they put a lot of care and love into uh, to the growing of the plant so I'm sure they're producing exceptional quality as well. But uh, looking at the other uh, side of the, the model, of course there's the, uh, the, the artisanal small quantity uh, growers but uh, then looking at, for example, the, the, the concept of McDonald's where you can have a big mass 
back, and it'll taste the same regardless of whether you're in, uh, where you're at, where I'm at, or in China, or uh, in Europe, or anywhere around the world. The Big Mac will taste identical, and the experience will be the same. Um, now, of course, you have a lot of stores. Uh, you're, you're anticipating uh, starting off with 22 retail locations across Colorado and Washington, and I'm sure you're going to be branching across the United States and possibly internationally. I look forward to seeing one in Ottawa here one day. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, the the point of the matter is this, is that especially as you get larger, um, just a thought. Uh, now, I remember in the previous uh, interview, you mentioned that because of Washington laws, you cannot be growing your own because of the situations that uh, the, the growers and the sellers cannot be the same entities. But could you not, for example, have a close business relationship with someone who is technically a separate company and a separate individual, but un, unofficially partnership to, in, in a sense where they're creating, uh, uh, they're growing uh, strains and of course from clones so that uh, you always have uh, clones identified that are uh, are exceptional uh, strains so having your friends uh, for example sativa that you were speaking of earlier you can have clones of that so that all of your retail locations can have the same um, unity sativa we'll, we'll just call it for lack of a better term since you didn't identify yeah, what, yeah, uh, what sure. it is the unity sativa yeah. so that all of your 22 locations or, or across the United States and Canada and other countries uh, when you eventually go internationally uh, can all enjoy this same fine, fine quality of product as well. So I'm just, just wondering, uh, like, of course, right now, I, n I understand initially uh, the, the market uh, model that you're going after is, of course, the, uh, the artisanal market, but is there the potential that you might sort of identify those exceptional strains and then go with the McDonald's approach where all your retail locations would have the same experience or the same type, the same product, essentially, uh, because artisanal does not, does not lend well to having all 22 locations having the same product. You understand what I'm saying here? Is that, I, is that I, something I, that you're going to be going totally into? Under, I totally understand what you're saying. So, uh, being it, so the McDonald's analogy, there's, there's a lot of things uh, that are imperfect about that. But I think your main point is about consistency. So yes. if we throw out all the negative aspects of McDonald's, but okay, just... Yes, I'm sorry, not not to be comparing you to uh, to a hamburger here. Of course, there's still the fine... To, but yes, of course. No, no, but but, but, let's, but, let, but but if we just keep consistency as a goal, absolutely. That is something that we, we definitely strive to achieve. And because we're going to be going from uh, art, artisan varieties, which have been developed by artisan breeders, grown by artisan growers, how do you take one of those amazing varieties which are cultivated with such care? Because so much of it is in the cultivation, right? Not just the genetics. And um, so how do we take an amazing variety which is cultivated with such care and how do we increase the volume of production in such a way that we do not impact negatively the quality of the product. That is a big, big challenge. It's actually my number one uh, challenge that we're dealing with as a company is how do we actually achieve that? And there are no uh, simple, easy answers because the it's not something that lends itself to uh, just you know full-scale automation and industrial agriculture uh, techniques, um, and it's uh, it's because a lot of our artisan growers, um, I mean, they they literally spend lots and lots of time with their plants. They touch them. They talk to them. Uh, some of them play music to them, and they can just feel the vibes going back and forth between them and the plants, and um, so. You know, in that kind of environment, the plants just absolutely thrive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, scaling that up, uh, short of cloning those particular growers, and that's obviously a joke, I, I wouldn't support that, <laughs> but, you know, how do we actually scale up in a way that, that preserves the amazing quality that we're experiencing? Um, that's, an unsolved, that's an unsolved problem, and uh, we're, just... we're working hard, hard on it, and, uh, but, but, we definitely can and are developing uh, close working relationships with a number of growers who will have completely independent companies, but that we will have close uh, supplier-purchaser relationships. 
Well, for what it's worth, uh, obviously, uh, perhaps I'm sure you'll be taking more of those bong rips to uh, to get the inspiration and the creativity on uh, solving this problem. I'll, I'm just going to be uh, in, Angel's advocate here. Uh, just yeah. Final uh, final point on this, uh, and then because I know we have to uh, wrap this up shortly, but. Uh, I'm sure some one of the questions that people might have is once you're eventually scaling up to those levels where you're able to supply consistent product across uh, numerous retail locations, um, then it begins to look like big tobacco in a sense of you know I, I hesitate of course to make comparisons to uh, to that industry, but nonetheless yeah. uh, they do have consistent product and and there's reasons for that as well, but. Uh, uh, they, I know they, they treat their their, their product uh, in numerous ways to make that consistency, but mm. um, can you just sort of uh, alleviate any potential concerns that people might be having? Because of, I, I know that people will be thinking, based on this conversation, that uh, th- there's a potential for w- once you start scaling things up, of course, you, you lose that artisanal aspect, but then, of course, there, you might start introducing um, practices that do resemble these these larger corporations, and of course, then it no longer has that artisanal uh, feel to it. So I realize that, of course, you're, you're saying that you, these are unsolved problems that you still are re- investigating solutions for, but is, do you have any words that you can perhaps say at this point to alleviate any potential concerns people might have uh, about you going down that road? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So I think a great, a great parallel example is that of uh, the retailer Whole Foods. Mm-hmm. And Whole Foods has grown to be a large, very successful retailer that does a tremendous amount of business, and the customers are extremely passionate about it. And yet, at the same time, they do a lot of local sourcing, and they carry a huge number of artisan-produced specialty foods, whether it's organic produce or whether it's manufactured products that are artisan made, um, that are 100% organic, very healthy, and at the same time, delicious and beautiful. So Mm -hmm. they have achieved that balance of of cultivating and preserving quality um, in virtually all of their products, uh, while at the same time also scaling up and making their products available to a very, very large segment of society. So it definitely can be achieved. It's it's a matter of orchestrating the the entire extended uh supply chain and of artisan growers and uh just, you know, making it all work. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, again, it's an unsolved problem. It's one that we're taking very seriously. We're working with a number of growers on this very topic and mm-hmm. uh I I'm confident we'll uh we'll we'll find a way to uh to make it work. Well, yet again, you always uh, find a marvelous way to to answer the questions, to inspire the confidence in the in what you're doing, and um, of course, bringing it back. To, I was, of course, focusing on McDonald's and the tobacco industry, but of course, you you bring it back to the, uh, the health food industry, and uh, I like the way that you do that. So, for what it's worth, um, anyhow, uh, uh, just a final uh, touch on and before we uh, end this call here. Uh, I, I remember that, of course, you, you mentioned that your products are to be savored like a, a fine wine, a cognac, a, a fine cigar. You're, you're going after this ex- exquisite experience. Uh, and I know that you've really captured the imagination of a lot of people when you, when you were speaking along those lines. Can you just sort of touch upon uh, the exquisite nature of, of the products, uh, the, the level of the, the quality. It's not just uh, from a production level, but from an experience, uh, c- contrasting it to, for example, what people might be getting on the streets today. Uh, how, how can they frame this in their minds? What, what can they expect once they eventually get to savor a uh, Diego Pacer uh, product? How, how will oh, this... Great. great question. Great question. Yeah. So, so here's, here's a good way of thinking about it. Um, uh, uh, Again, I'll draw, I'll draw from a parallel from history. So back in the age of Prohibition, um, uh, where you had moonshine, of course, you know, what was the number one characteristic that people looked for was alcohol content. Am I going to be able to get drunk off of this stuff? You know, it was not, it was not about flavor um, or any of the finer points because, again, brands had to uh, 
essentially go into deep freeze. The, the, the great alcohol brands, which had been established for decades prior to Prohibition, those had to go into deep freeze mode in the United States. And so um, it was all about potency. And so I think today you similarly have a, a, a certain obsession among a lot of people with, you know, hey, well, is it how potent is it? You know, how high is the THC content? Mm -hmm. And so, again, going from prohibition to post-prohibition, you went from moonshine to fine wine and fine cognac and mm -hmm. fine, you know, uh, fine whiskey. Um, what you, I think we're going to be, we're experiencing, I've personally experienced uh, a transition from talking about, you know, THC content to a lot uh, to varieties of cannabis which are much gentler, have lower THC content, and have just an incredible bouquet of cannabinoids and the various types of THC. There's more than one type of THC. And so, the, for example, the, the, the fine uh, sativa, organic sativa uh, variety that I was talking about, let's call it unity for, you know, for, for now. Uh, okay. The Unity variety is not a super high THC variety, even though it's a sativa. Um, lower THC content, but an incredible blend of, uh, of cannabinoids and THC uh, varieties, which um, result in an in incredibly gentle experience, which just beckons the heart and mind and soul to open up and to... Uh, seek out and develop unity and promote unity and stand for unity uh, in a very courageous way. And so I'm just talking about my own, my own personal experiences with it, whereas, you know, I've, I've, I've also tried some varieties which are very high in THC and have a, just a completely different effect. And um, so I think, so just as a fine wine has a relatively low alcohol content, you know, what is it maybe like, I don't know, 13, 14 percent. Uh, or even beer is even lower. Oh, exactly. Craft beer is it can be much lower. It can be three and a half, four percent. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's it the conversation shifts from potency to experience and the subtleties. And I think in the case of of cannabis, I think it's it blows away the range of experiences that fine wines afford. Uh, of course, you know. Different varieties of fine wines, wow, you can have, you know, just, yeah, a very different experience. But the, the range of those experiences for wine, I think, is blown away by the range that you can experience for cannabis, where you've got, you know, extremes of psychoactive versus, you know, a nice body high and a real very relaxing versus one versus varieties which really stimulate creativity and brainstorming. And I, I literally think of it as brain food. Um, mm -hmm. All the way down, to, you know, to those which help you fall asleep and just completely relax and alleviate anxiety. So there's so it's just a, a extremely rich and broad spectrum of experiences. So um, I think that I think that the focus will go much more in that direction and away from the sort of you know single variable of potency. Right. Well, for what it's worth, uh, I've had this discussion a number of times, actually, with uh, people that, of course, when you have these high-potency strains, you know, 20% or sometimes even a bit higher, uh, you just smoke a, a little crumb <laughs> in a yeah. pipe. or And so you, you're not really savoring anything. You're, you're just basically getting a, a quick little puff and uh, you're high. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. You got the effect, but you haven't had the uh, the, the savoring experience. So kind of like uh, getting a, a sip of moonshine versus uh, taking uh, some wa a glass of wine. Of course, you have the nuances of the wine. Maybe the bouquet of the wine is fruity or dry, like whatever your preferences may be. And, uh, of course, there's uh, some people who actually prefer lower THC strains uh, and lower lower cannabinoid strains uh, that are high in flavor. So you, they have the, the various different flavonoids, uh, uh, the terpenes uh, in it. And of course, I give it the various different uh, scents. And so you can enjoy uh, a nice pipe or a joint or, or whatever, or even in a vaporizer, you can actually uh, taste and, and smell the, uh, the fine aromas that are in cannabis, kind of like people drink a cup of coffee or sniff wine uh, or a brandy or, or sherry. I mean, these, these, there's, there's the sensual... 
uh, olfactory uh, experience uh, really adds to to the enjoyment. And of course, cannabis, people love just smelling the buds. People love the aroma of it as well, especially if you get some uh, strains. I, I remember this one strain that some people uh, shared with me once. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget the experience. I'm actually looking looking forward to one day uh, being able to go into a store, because unfortunately we don't have stores where I'm at uh, that you can get this kind of stuff. I'm looking forward to a Diego Perry store where you can walk up and say, hey, I want this blueberry strain. Uh, I remember this blueberry strain. I, it was just heaven. It was like blueberries mixed with like lavender or or lilacs or something that floral it mm. it it was just such like the high itself was was absolutely wonderful but forget about the high and the cannabinoid experience just the the olfactory the the taste the the experience much like sipping on a wine it was pleasant and so so i, I can see that uh, if you get uh, some fine fine products that are not just uh, about the cannabinoid contents but about the uh, m- much like a fine cognac a fine wine a fine cigar you're savoring the experience not just the uh, uh, the high not just the uh, the effects of the uh, the medicine or the or the uh, the thc but the the experience itself is is something to be desired, and a lot of people love. And so I think that's is that's kind of what you're saying along those lines. Absolutely, oh. you you you've you've expressed it extremely well. Yeah, and there's there's you know kind of there's the experience of the flavor and the color and the beauty of it and how delicious it is. And then of course there's the experience of the the mind and body sensations of the high itself and very different but but also very complimentary because when you taste those flavors that that's like the very first indication of the kind of beautiful experience that you're going to have overall very similar to wine a delicious wine is also wine where you'll just have a great evening enjoying a fine bottle of wine with with a loved one so very well said bobby well, Jamin, I uh, know we've been talking for quite a while, so I just want to say uh, I'm so looking forward to one day, like personally, I, I, I'm really looking forward to one day going to one of your shops once, of course, it becomes sufficiently legal for you to uh, be fully in business and uh, f- having a full experience uh, of everything that you've been talking about uh, during this call. I hope that a lot of other people who have been listening uh, to this uh, are inspired as well. And uh, when that day comes, I, I, I hope that there will be quite a large uh, line of, of people waiting for that unique experience to uh, to be enjoyed and savored. And thank you very much for uh, for creating this opportunity for for all of us to to have this experience. You, you are creating something wonderful. You're you're doing it in a socially responsible way. Uh, you're really paving this uh, this path with uh, with a lot of care and respect. And um, I have to say that. A lot of us really do have to to thank you for what what it is that you're doing, and of course, I know that this uh, this is just the start of your journey. I wish you uh, continued success, and uh, <laughs> and as I sort of uh, made the joke on the uh, um, on one of the things that I wrote uh, for you, you know, uh, thank you for opening up uh, the, the windows of opportunity for us uh, to be experiencing the finest uh, that cannabis has to offer, and that uh, you never see a, a blue screen of death. Uh, <laughs> In this, uh, may you can have continued success, and uh, uh, and I, I look forward to to seeing how your story evolves over the coming years as well. So I know this is just the beginning of uh, of the journey that you've been starting to walk, Jamin. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you so much for creating what you're doing and these amazing conversations that you're having with so many people, shedding so much light on this amazing. Uh, plant and this amazing industry that we're that we're all creating together and thank you for giving me the time to to share my particular story and what we're doing with Diego Pellicer and uh, I'm excited to continue the conversation with you and uh, look forward to uh, just a a lot of uh, a lot more conversations in-depth conversations as we as we develop this opportunity for for the world. So thank you, Bobby. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Jamin. And uh, for what it's worth, uh, let's agree now that next year's uh, for the next year's summit, let's uh, do a follow-up interview. I'd love to hear what uh, what you've been doing uh, over the next year, and of course, uh, hopefully, you'll you'll actually open up the doors to your stores that you're uh, you're you're hoping everything will will happen as you you're planning. And uh, I, I look forward to the continuing uh, evolution of uh, of everything that you're doing. You're you're doing fantastic things. So thank you for what you're doing, and thank you again for uh, for sharing your story with us at the summit today. You're welcome, Bobby. Thank you. <laughs>